All right, welcome back to the I Am There podcast, guys. I'm your host, Freyway. I'm here with my co-host, Kenny. And today we have a very special guest, one of my teammates from ARG days and YCS topper, great player. Um, he has started a YouTube channel that has become really popular, Yu-Gi-Oh! History. He's the man in the hat. He's innovator of Dino Rabbit with Macrocosmos. One of the longest YCS top streaks ever in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. One of the greatest article writers ever. Uh, some of those articles still stand the test of time. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we have Joe Giorlando joining us today. So, Joe, how are you? I was wild. <laughs> I'm doing really well. Thank you. How are you? I'm 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 good. I'm glad to have you on. Uh, we've been trying to schedule this for a while now. We finally got it in because our schedules aligned. This is a perfect time for you. You you are a teacher, right? A school teacher, right? That is what I do for a job. Yeah, I'm a school teacher, so I'm on winter break right now. Just this winter break. This is my second podcast. I was on Farfa's Twitch stream, kind of helping him understand how to sequence old formats. Mm -hmm. And I've recorded at least three videos. Plus, I've gone to like three locals for modern oh, man. So I've, I've had a go. pretty Yu-Gi-Oh! intensive last seven days off. That's great. I, I've been doing some yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh! stuff too. I went to locals last night and on Thursdays. Me too. Yep, yep. On Thursdays, I also go to locals. So tomorrow night, I'll be going. And I went last Thursday because that was the start of my vacation for um for my work. And yeah, I've been loving watching Yu-Gi-Oh! I don't actually play at all, but I do I do like to spectate. I love I don't know. I've always liked spectating, strangely. Uh I I was judging for a while and people would ask me why am I doing that? Like there's not you know, there's no money in it, there's no anything in it. Like, why are you judging when you could just play or you could just do nothing instead? And I was like, I kinda like watching matches. I have a thing for just observing people play and how they think. And that, there's that, a voyeur. Yeah. So, but Joe, when I go ahead. knew what was going on, I preferred watching to playing to make deck building decisions and understand a format because yeah. it's almost like you can do two things at once. You can watch and see what they did and then watch and think what you would have done. And it's almost like you've doubled. You both played the match, at least in your head, but also saw the outcome from a different line of play. Mm -hmm. But I knew it was going on, which is not the case quite as well now in modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, but like say 10 years ago, I definitely preferred testing via watching than testing via playing. I agree with what you said 100% in that case, because I always felt the same way. I felt like, I don't know if you ever watched anime Naruto, but Naruto could clone himself literally. And he would use that to train. And then when he cancels the clones, they would all come back into him and he would gain all the information that all the clones got while they were training. So in a way, when I'm standing there judging and I'm watching tables one, two, and three all at the same time, I'm watching three matches as opposed to just playing my one match if I were a competitor. And I kind of watch how they all unfold and what I would do in each case. It's it's pretty much what you just said. And I, I've always liked that a lot. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. You have to know what's going on, but it, yes, if you know it, what is going on. It's a little harder now because I, I can't say that I can follow the game 100% as far as the player's mindset. Like I kind of get the basic combos like Sword Soul pretty much does the same thing every game. Like Phantom Knight, I've seen the combo. Uh, a lot of the decks, you know, they're streamlined to me in my head now, like Drytron, all of those. They pretty much do the same thing. They might do it in a slightly different way, but I kind of get the general idea of what they're trying to do when they're comboing off. What I don't understand is the macro decisions that the players make now. And I think that's probably where you are, too, is like, why did you negate that? You know, because that's like the biggest thing is like, how do you use your resources in the current game? Everyone sets up a board of negates and just says go. And then the opponent starts to play through it and you have to see how they respond. Uh, and I think that that is a big part of the game is like knowing when to use your Ash Blossom, knowing when to use your Barone or whatever, and, you know, choosing what you should actually be negating, what you should be letting resolve, et cetera. Totally agree. That's a huge part of it. And definitely something I struggled with when I started to play again. Yeah. I, I've basically had to sit down in solitaire combo-ish decks like that to try and find choke points. Yeah. Like if they stop, that's you really here. been a, yeah. So basically with Drytron and then the bird up deck, that's how I've preferred to learn how to play against them is to just solitaire them. Mm -hmm. And then like learn the basic combos, solitaire them. And then when you're playing against them, one, you recognize the combos because you've practiced them yourself. But two, you also can start to understand why they're doing things in the order that they're doing. Cause you say, okay, well they're doing that cause they don't have this, this or this because it's more optimal to do a, but now they're doing B, which means they have like two of the combo pieces, not three. So now I know I have a better chance of how to hand trap them. So yeah. solitary combo decks, I have found to be a valuable way to really quickly try to learn how to play against them. Not that I'd ever want to play Drytron myself, but you're going to play against it eventually. Yeah, you don't look like a Drytron player to me. When I think of your play style from back in the day, Drytron does not fit the bill. Um, I have a question real yeah. quick about your both of your opinion on something. 
I think every Yu-Gi-Oh player has done this, where you solitaire out the first turn or two in any format, right? Yeah. With your deck, you just kind of shuffle. It's fun to shuffle, draw your first five. Like, um, what do you think I do with the deck profiles after I put, <laughs> before I put them away? <laughs> do you think? Uh, do you think it's easier? to solitaire the decks nowadays because it seems like nowadays almost all the decks are more combo decks and the game doesn't really last much longer than three turns do you think it's easier because i feel like back in the day if you were to solitaire you could only really get a handle of the first one or two turns but then after that the game has too much interaction by turn 10 yeah i get what you mean kenny by that what do you think joe that's weird because I think you actually can just play two decks against yourself and actually use that for testing. Like literally, that's what I've been doing. This like past right week. now, right? Yeah. Like, like because you can actually just because the game is two turns. So like I'm gonna start. I'm gonna make my board. <laughs> like I'll, I'll I'll play with my opponent's hand reveal, but it's not like I'm gonna play around the cards, right? I'm just gonna make yeah what I think would be the optimal play, <laughs> and then I'll just move to the other side of the table, and it's like okay, they have one negate here, like, and I'll try and play through it, but try and do it authentically. Yeah, yeah. And the game just lasts two turns anyway, so you just played a whole match. And you get to see both perspectives. And <laughs> it's funny because I really think it's a, a style of testing that I didn't think applied ten years ago because yeah, the matches it, would take yeah. ten turns. Exactly. It's funny you're not you're not trying to be funny right now, but I actually found <laughs> what you're saying to be hilarious. Is, and Kenny clearly does as well. It's great. Like you play the dry trump board, okay? Like the hand traps are going to be played at certain points. If you play them at the optimal points because you know how to use them, yeah, then you can sort of authentically hand trap yourself. And then there's X negates, X whatever, and yeah, you go to the other Herald, side. Like. I'm going Can I to break negate. Board? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to negate every single thing you do until you're dead. Uh, and if like, you okay, want... I can't break it. All right, dry trons win. Like, right. Next game. You didn't right. draw. What is it? Forbidden droplet. Yeah, you don't draw droplet. droplet. Yeah, you just pretty much lose. And a lot of the games do. You know, they end that fast. Two turns. I've been arguing that one of the reasons why I do not play right now is because I just do not like the idea of. Uh, I, I want to play competitive. If I did play at all. I'm not a casual, I've never been. So for me, I would need to test a lot and then do all of that prep and then to fly out, book flight, hotel, all that stuff. And to sit across a, an opponent and have them literally source or combo me into oblivion. I mean, like, it just doesn't seem like something I personally want to do. I don't think I mind Sword Soul that much. I mean, the the play that they make, the sort of typical board, is powerful, but it's not with or besides Protos. But there's a person in my local tournament. I've played them two locals in a row. They played PK. I've played Sword Soul. And it literally went, you know, Scythe. He, he Scythed me. I Protosed him. Game three, he bricked. Like, he drew double anti-spell and yep, couldn't do anything. And you killed him. And, and I killed him. And yeah. then the next time I played him, he won the roll, and then he went Scythe. And then I went Protos, and then game three, I drew zero hand traps, and he scythed me again. So we've had six turns. And two matches. And all six games, all six games were predetermined. Yep. There was no playing around cards. It was just a predetermined outcome. That's two whole matches in six games. Like, yep. we didn't have any back and forth in any capacity. He didn't try and break my board. I didn't try and break his board because there was zero opportunity to do so. It was a predetermined outcome. <laughs> That's frustrating. Jeez. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Scythe and Protos specifically... Because those cards activate at an awkward time, there's really not much you can do, especially Protoss. Like, he, you really can't even respond to it unless you have, I guess, like Valor or uh, the Impermanence. Yeah, those are the only cards, I guess, Gamma technically, but like, does Gamma negate if you don't destroy? Um, it's just bad. It's a, it's a bad thing because like Protoss can't be destroyed by card effects. It, it's just, yeah. yeah, the games just end really quickly. When I was interviewing Tommy Rowe, he said that like Scythe wasn't performing that well, at least on a like the remote dual YCS, but as far as the local level, like people are playing it. And even at my local, oh, people sure. are definitely playing Scythe. I don't think PK got any of the top 16 spots for the US. I don't think it did either. I could be mistaken. And I don't think it did particularly well overseas. It did well in like like the Artifact Sky Striker deck, but that's a totally different beast. Yeah. And I think there was only a couple Drytron decks that ran that package. I still think it's it's still really good innately. I, I mean, yeah, like on paper, it, it's really it obviously the game. If it doesn't do well over the course of 14 rounds, that's a totally different story. Yes. It's still going to beat you. It's not like you can right. do a whole lot. Yes, there are outs to it. There's, there's outs to everything. Exactly. So for there's locals... Obviously Cosmic Cyclone and Chalice, and there are DD Crow. There are technically ways to stop these things, but you literally need it or you just... The game is over. Yes. For locals, you're going to run into people playing the most variance the high variance cards, and they will actually get off on you because it's locals and it's only like a couple rounds. And the variance of their deck doesn't really matter that they're playing these like high variance cards like Scythe and I can't even say Protoss is not a high variance card because that card is searchable no. and it does it every single time. So that card's actually just toxic in general. But like you might get killed by Imperial Order, you know, like two rounds and it's kind of like, well, shit, you know, that or Harpies, the, the trap Harpy card that the, yeah. the wing beast decks where it's, you know, it's non-searchable. 
Yep, but if but, I draw it, you lose. I, I mean, what am I going to side Red Reboot? I could. I probably have to side Red Reboot, but... Yeah, you have to. It's a one of against their non-searchable three of. Yep. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. There's just a lot of the game, because the game is only one turn. There are a lot of cards that, okay, that game is over. Yep, so needless to say, they need to get rid of Scythe, Protoss, and that Harpy's Featherstorm card. Uh, probably Imperial, Imperial Order. Order. Yeah, Imperial Order as well. And I think that that will cut down a lot of the... We're just playing a non-interaction game because those cards are just zero interaction for the most part. Like if you don't have the out on the spot, you actually lose. There's no like you can't do any. There's no bluffing anymore. There's no like, oh, I said maybe Mirror Force or something like there's none of that. I think so many cards just have negation effects, too. I think to really solve some of the grievances that I might have, you would also need to do similar things to cards like Apollosa that almost every deck can play that in and of itself is really powerful. It's like back in the day, it'd be Stardust, but yeah. it, it only would stop a small percentage of cards or thought really, and you kind of had to decide, do I care about targeting? Do I care about destruction? And Or even Colossal Fighter, do I care about big monsters? Like yep. the decision points, you were sort of, that's just Apollosa, just turn one, Every a lot of decks can summon that. I, I think you could even go further and talk about cards like the Samorg that summons the barrier statue that, I mean, there's just so many yeah, that's iterations of first watch. turn that just you just can't just can't do anything. I watched a friend of mine do that at locals to somebody the one time I went with Razor. Leon, he right? Just, yeah, he was just like I just set up. He set the statue up, and the other guy just like shuffled his deck. <laughs> so I think too many. So every card game is has luck. Every card game is variance. Yu-Gi-Oh at numerous points in time has had issues that are similar to this. But I think a higher percentage of games are predetermined now than i used to remember yes like don't get me wrong and you look at someone's hand and they go first they have rabbit tour guide that's a predetermined outcome yeah usually but that's also two cards that are not really searchable right and you have to draw them for every game that you technically draw tour guide rabbit you also draw cabazal sabersaurus you have the same odds yep. right so i feel like yes in the course of an 11 round event, you would probably lose to a Macro Rabbit player or a Dino Rabbit player that would do that combo. But it was a non searchable combo. And assuming it only happened one of those games, you should probably still find a way to win the other two. Yeah. And also, now I feel like everything's searchable now. Everything. The whole oh, the whole Source Old deck is a searchable combo. The entire, the whole Drytron deck is a searchable combo. It's one big searchable deck. It's like every deck is every extremely searchable. Now. Card up. Every deck has, like, you get one or two cards, and then you go into, like, a 15-card combo where you're just in your deck, and then you set up a full board. You're just like, oh, all right, cool. Yeah. It's like, even decks that aren't Tier 1, I played against a, a water discard deck. So if you're not familiar with that, it's, it has the Mermel Atlantean type cards in it, mm -hmm. but Dragoon is at 3, and that's not a once per turn, and it has Moulin Glacia, an old card. But there are some water cards that are pretty powerful that, you know, let you discard waters, look at your opponent's hand, get rid of a card to the end phase. And I remember I sat down and it was like nine minutes into the first turn. He's finally <laughs> finished minutes. his turn. I, ha I haven't played any hand. I just sit there and just let him do his thing. And I top the desires and actually get out of it. But, you know, my response to his board, which has no negations or anything, just a bunch of discard, took a little a couple minutes. And so now we're like 25 minutes into the clock. And yep. we've had realistically one iteration of a turn. The vast majority of his, he goes first game two and does the same thing. So, you know, he's played for 20 minutes and I've sort of just sat there with my arms crossed, like watching cards in my hand get discarded. <laughs> And <laughs> I mean, 20 minutes, that used to be a lot of turns. Yes, that is. All, 20 minutes was all. That might have been That's two a games. Lot of turns. That might have been two games. No, th this was three turns. It was his opening turn twice and then my response to it in game one. Yeah, I don't like how long it takes to combo in Yu-Gi-Oh! right now. That is one of my biggest gripes. And my, the reason why it's such a big gripe is because of the time rule as well. The new time yeah, rule being sure. that as soon as they say time, end of the phase, the game's over. I think it's terrible uh i've been very vocal about that i think pretty much every competitive player is pretty vocal about how awful the time rule has has been changed to i don't like it at all i've yet to hear a single person come on this podcast and say no it's actually pretty good for this reason yeah. i haven't I mean, heard like, a single say that you've been a loyal like i say sky striker player who's that deck can take a long time naturally but if you've been a player that has benefited from it because you tend to play decks that can either gain or burn yep you might Say, oh, it's a horrible rule, but sort of deep down know that, ha, huh, I've been winning plenty of matches with uh -huh. this. And... There's some players who are known in the community for actually abusing that rule with stuff like what you just said. Uh, Kaima I mean, is the Sky Striker that yep. does it. And people, there's stories of top players stalling and then summoning Kaina and gaining life, like blatantly looking at the clock and playing extremely slow, looking at Graveyard, how many cards in hand. We all know how it goes. This is not something oh, yeah. new. This has been around before that time rule existed. People knew how to stall and they're still doing it. One of the first regionals I went to when I first came back, right before COVID hits, this is February before COVID hit, so a month okay. before COVID hit. I remember round one of a regional. Like we're getting close to time. I am in a very dominating position. 
and I go pot of extravagance because I, I don't actually have the ability to deal enough damage. I do need to like try into something. Yeah. So I like shuffle extra deck and I like throw it to my opponent. And I'm like, all right, let's go quickly. And I remember him sitting there and he's like pondering like, which ones do I want to pick? And I'm like, this is random. Can you just like pick the top cards? Wow. And I ended up like calling a judge over and the does like, oh nothing really can do God. about it. And I'm like, I'm like, pot of extravagance by rule is random. He's, it's almost like he's trying to pick cards that are either foil or what right. he's really doing is stalling. He doesn't want me to get to my battle phase. Like this is what he's actually doing. Yes, that is, and that is insane actually. And then, you know, the person's arguing, no, I have the right to, you know, pick cards. I'm like, yes, but it, it is still random. If you're admitting that you're intentionally picking cards in a non-random way, then we're not fulfilling the card's effect. The card is randomly <laughs> banished six. See, I like you, Joe. You're smart. <laughs> That's the shit right there. I like that. <laughs> I like Joe. But it didn't work. And now, so time gets called. It's main phase one. It's like, great. So, uh, you know, he's sitting there with, the, if it was an altar guy's deck. And all he had was one bounce. He had like a silk and a protocol that he just kept flipping and then bouncing my yep. monster. So I haven't been able to deal damage, but you know, one main phase into battle phase, I would have been able to do it, but time gets called and so he wins because damn, of the damn, so that's, that's the damage. awful. Yeah, that's I, I one thing I like for the people who are listening, if you're not familiar with Joe G. Orlando, because he's an old school player, he's been out the game for a while, but this guy is exceptionally intelligent. And I love hearing his takes. We used to talk all the time about just literally everything, all different types of scenarios. And as you can hear from the way he talks, he's just very, very knowledgeable of one people's intentions right like this guy is basically intending to stall the game out but also trying to do it under the guise of well i have the the right to pick the cards like yes you do but random is random like there is nothing in between that like you have to be random so you technically should just if you wanted to be really quick be like roll a die you know oh it rolled on two these two roll another die like these three and then be done with it like you know just something like i shuffled it. my extra deck like just cut it or yeah. shuffle it Top it shouldn't six, take I mean, longer than 10 seconds. Yeah, I also I know, think that that card should be written where you just do it yourself. Honestly, like shuffle the extra deck, you pass to your opponent, they cut it, and then you just, that's it. Like it shouldn't even well, be. Well, that is sort of the standard. I mean, that is. Yes. I didn't even know until you just said universally that. universally accepted. Yes. I mean, that's what I assume. I mean, that's honestly the, what we had been doing. Yeah. we were. It was literally a mirror match. We were both playing Pot of Extravagance, right? Like that's what we had been doing. Now, all of a sudden with 90 seconds left on the clock. Oh, no. I played Pot of Extravagance. A... I hand him my extra deck and he like fans it out. And I'm just like, I can you like speed this up here? And he's like, no, I gotta, you know, pick cards. And I'm just like, I know what you're doing. I'm gonna call a judge. He's like, oh no, I have to pick the cards. And I'm like, I get you have to pick the cards, but could you pick them so like we can get this going? Yeah, now with more and, context, know. it's even more blatant that he was uh cheating. I mean, that's just cheating at that point. And now, like in context of what you're saying, you guys both played the card in this match before he was doing the standard way, which is I'll just shuffle my extra deck, I'll give it to you, you'll cut, and I'll just six of them or three of them, whatever. You know, uh, he's doing this, like, pushes a card. Like, I have it fanned out, and he's, like, pushing a card. And he's like, hmm, which is my second one? I'm like, oh my God. what about you do it for six banishes? Is yeah. it going to be a 90 seconds? See, I don't have the patience for that now. And he, like, I, when, I, when we well, were I younger. I didn't either. I mean, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> 90, 80, 70. And I'm like, all right, come on now. Like, could we speed this up That here? type of situation might get me banned in 2022. Like, I, I don't know if I would have the patience to do. Like, the person that I am now. I've been out the game for quite a while, almost half a decade now. It's almost five years. I just, I don't think I have the patience to to deal with the things that I was, I put up with a lot of stuff when I played Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively um, years ago, right? Like for the sake of the game, for the love of the game, there was a lot of situations. People looking at your bottom card when they shuffle. I hated that. Every time somebody picks up my deck, when you, like the, before the match starts, you don't know what I'm playing. Let's say it's round one. I'm playing against a random guy. Neither one of us knows what the other one's playing, or we really shouldn't. And he just picks up my deck, looks at the bottom cards. So I used to fucking put cards on the bottom of my deck that are just, they don't give away anything, right? Like the most generic thing. So that, that way, like, oh, yeah. you see a Torrential Tribute. Everyone plays Torrential back in the day. So it's like, that doesn't tell you anything. Just because I knew that a lot of people would do that. I hate. I always so did that much. to start. So I, when I took it out of my deck box, yep. I always did that. Yeah. It was so always like something heavy storm or yeah, not even like, that like even more generic than that sometimes like yeah as generic as it could get yep something that literally every deck was playing at the time you would be like well this is the most play card in, in the format uh i'll just put this at the bottom that way when they inadvert like even if it's inadvertent look at the bottom of my deck so, some people might do it by accident supposedly uh, i just i hate it so much i don't know if i could deal with that anymore i would just tell people please can you not pick up the deck just keep it parallel to the table at all times um there's just a lot of things that i just i've never I never liked that I had to do, but I just accepted it as part of the game. I uh, tell people to play faster when we're about to go into time and having to rush them, but then like coming into it, coming across an opponent like yours who knows how to be smart about it, I'll say. Like, well, technically, he I won the to... match because of it. Yeah, I mean... like he knew what he was doing, and technically, he like you know he's he's right about the whole like I get the pick thing, and it's like all right, Jesus, like what are we doing? It's so weird that they that they get the pick. It should just be sh they get to cut the deck, and then we fucking yeah. The card should be well, that is the way it is. 
Does it even say opponent? I don't know what the card is written, but it's just sort of in order to verify that the randomization occurred, there's always sort of that opponent can cut back. Mm, I don't yeah. know if the card actually says your opponent picks. No, it just says banish three or six random cards face it. It doesn't actually have the word opponent on it. Yeah. But, you know, anytime something randomly happens, there's always that. I'll shuffle it and give it to my opponent. Yeah, That's basically just yeah. universal. Yeah, because random can't be left up to you alone, right? Like, you can't be the only person. I mean, except I, for moduls, I guess, but I, even they have I, uh, ways to do. I theoretically have my extra deck in a certain order. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would. Yeah. I always have my have in a certain order. Yeah, it, it is in a default order. Yes. So if they do, if I am playing that particular card, even a shuffle might not necessarily fully randomize it because yeah. it started in a particular order. So I do understand the opponent maybe being able to a couple riffles and cut, but not fan it out and let me pick them individually. Yeah, it's ridiculous. All right, well, let, let's let's move on. Um, that, sure. that is a very interesting thing, though. Uh, I do want to rewind a bit. So we we've already jumped into like current Yu-Gi-Oh and we're going to go back to it. But I want to I want to turn back the clock because you are the Yu-Gi-Oh historian. How did you even get into Yu-Gi-Oh, Joe? Like, how did how did this even start? Where did you begin? It was the television show, a story that a lot of people have said. I've listened to quite a lot of podcasts from a lot of old school players, and mm -hmm. a lot of them start in a very similar point, which is watching the television show. And for me, the first time I ever saw that the television show translated to actual product was a trip to the mall. It was the Burlington Mall in Massachusetts, a pretty reasonable sized mall, but close to where I grew up. I went to the now long gone KB Toys, but inside there they had the structure decks, they had Metal Raiders packs, Blue Eyes, and I remember buying a Metal Raiders pack and a a Yuki structure deck, a Kaiba structure deck, sort of the basics. I pulled a Barrel Dragon out of the Metal Raiders pack. So pretty good hit. That's back pretty in the nice. Day. And it looks pretty cool. good. That was pretty good. That was a pretty good card. Yeah. yeah. And you that were was hooked it. immediately hooked. after that. I knew that that just that, that, that was it. Even prior to that, I was playing like fake Yu Gi Oh with Pokemon cards, right? Okay. I was trying to replicate the rules of Yu Gi Oh with Pokemon cards with my cousin at the time. And that's a new one. Yeah. Right. That was totally weird. But for me, <laughs> The one of the big driving forces is that close to where I grew up, about a 10 minute drive away, was a local card shop. And had that card shop not existed, I don't know what would have ended up happening because just buying packs is one thing, but going to a store where there's tens and twenty and dozens of other people playing is huge and really important too. And I remember going to my first local. I remember the round one opponent, his name is Rob. I remember after the match, after he just destroyed me. He looked at my deck, told me you should probably cut Garnelius Elephantis, which was a no effect 2400 2000 monster, had the same stats as Red Eye. So I thought it was pretty good because of that, but obviously not very good. He told me to pick a theme and stick to it. I remember I picked Fiend as sort of the first theme. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when Dark Necrofear came out, it like seemed like just the greatest boss monster to go in this Fiend deck that I was building. And from that point, it was a long journey, but that is where it started. From the TV show to opening packs at the mall, the Burlington Mall, to realizing that there was a store close to where I grew up that was going to have weekly tournaments. So when does it... TP1. That's how far back I go, TP1. So where does it become competitive? Where do you... Because we, I, I have the similar story like you. I started, you know, same way, essentially, the, the TV show, the anime, and then I kind of transitioned into, oh, this is a real-life thing as well, playing it with the people at my school, et cetera, et cetera. And Fiends was also one of my first decks ever. Um, but where does it become competitive for you? So now the next step is you don't want to be trash anymore. So I think... For me, looking back at my playing career, that's a weird word to use, but I'll just use it. my career. Yeah, I say there's career. sort of been. Yeah, I, I think it is. There's sort of moments where a really big event happened and then it was on to the next goal. And for me on the local scene, it was always to win locals. But when I first started early teens, even before I was a teenager, I just wasn't very good. I struggled. Sometimes I'd get out of the first round. It was a single elimination tournament. And for me, my goal was always I need to win the batters up local. That was a huge huge motivation at real a young quick, age real quick were you always really tall were you like a big uh, yeah I, I was always sort of on the 90th percentile if you want to use those okay so you were a tall so preteen yeah i was always relatively tall yeah for sure okay All right, so that was so uh, sort of always the driving force and it's beginning of batters up the locals were actually pretty big i mean we're talking about so big that we had people playing on the floor because the actual playing space didn't have enough tables so tp1 days days of Jinzo and everything. I mean, there were 40, 50, 60 people going to these locals. But yeah. as time went on, the, the size of the locals dwindled. And the local was never overwhelmingly competitive, though I will say early, early, early Yu-Gi-Oh! Before the days of YCSs or SJCs even, the types of decks that people ran were always all over the place, right? Or, oh, yeah. or Deal of the Travelers, Guardian Sphinx. I yep. mean, the decks didn't really have the refinement that they would have in the following years. But for me, early on, I would go to that local every week, but the size would dwindle. And eventually got to a point where... I ended up winning. It was during what would have been technically GOAT format, 
but my local scene wasn't overwhelmingly competitive and we weren't actually running goat control. I was running a a zombie sacred Phoenix deck, but I remember calling my parents and saying, I won my first local and sort of that moment and that feeling of winning, but it was like a 12, 15 person local. At that point, the size had dwindled. It really wasn't overwhelmingly competitive, but it still meant a lot in the moment. For sure. Um, What you said is true at that time, like, uh, I don't know, the internet wasn't as common. Not everybody just played the same deck or a variation of the same three decks, right? You could go, you go to your local and there'd be like the one guy that plays clown control every week. And then like this other guy that sure. plays a question deck and, you know, all that yep. random crap. I showed up the yep. local playing Warrior Toolbox. It was my first local oh, yeah. tournament. I played Warrior Toolbox and I played the Dark Necrofear Fiend deck with like three Slate Warrior, three Giant Orc, three yeah, yeah. Green Soldier. Um, you know, Goblin deck King. By, the Goblin King for sure. Yeah, that was like my first... Those were my first decks. That was before yeah. I realized that chaos. I didn't know that metagame.com was a thing. That's how far. Oh, back. yeah. I'm going to get to that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. It's cool because nowadays, like, uh, especially a lot of even less competitive players, people that just play at locals will still update their decks for the meta. But back in the day, you'd have a guy that's like, no, I'm an Archfiend player. And and at month after month, they play Archfiends in some way, shape or form. We're like an Amazon player. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. that definitely existed, at, especially Galaxy. Can you know about Galaxy and Philly? Yeah, that was like one of my first locals, and we definitely had for every person was like he a is dinosaur. Yes, he's a dinosaur player. He's a zombie player. Like the guy Cam who was on our No Way Home Spider Man episode, he played fiends. He was known as like the fiend player. He always played fiends no matter what. We had other people who only played like insects, etc. So kind of like the TV show, we all adopted a theme and we all played that mm-hmm. theme. Uh, yeah. Yep. Very similar. In GOAT format, at the end of GOAT format, the final GOAT SJC was actually in Boston, and I'm from Massachusetts. I didn't actually go to that that Shonen Jump, but I did hear about it. And for me, that introduced me to the idea of, oh, there are actually events beyond just these 15 people showing up at Batters Up. And the following year, the next time the SJC circuit rolled around to Boston, I was aware that it was going to happen, and I made plans to go there. So the very first event beyond Batters Up that I ever attended was the Shonen Jump in 2006, the one that Bobby Chambers won after Chaos Sorcerer was banned and sort of that, that it wasn't an emergency ban, but they pushed the ban list up a month so they could ban Sork ahead of time. Yeah. But it was that, that event. And after that event, that night, I was introduced to Metagame because I heard that site was used for the coverage of the event. And I wanted to go home and read the coverage. Yeah, right. I saw all of these isolated areas where these are feature matches. And I was really curious, you know, what is happening over there? Are these like best players? So I went home that night and I mean, it might sound weird, but it's almost like I fell in love with that website because I went back yeah. and read every single article, every single deck profile match, everything from the entire history, from the very first Shonen Jump or even the first U.S. Na- the U.S. Nationals all the way up to the Shonen Jump in Boston. And the second day that I went back on Sunday, I obviously didn't qualify for Sunday, but I recognized people based on the coverage. I was like, oh, that that's Dale Belito. You know, that's Anthony Alvarado. These are the names of the top players that I saw not only do well day one, but do well throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history, maybe even win Shonen Jump throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history. Now I see them in person. And then there was that, it just sort of clicked. Like this circuit, this environment, this competitive scene is something I really want to really want to do. And then it was, all right, how do I find out where the next regional is, the next Shonen Jump? And I would soon over the coming years play regionals and Shonen Jumps. And yeah, it's actually that interesting. itch to be more competitive. We have, I, mean, I guess I would be 15 years old because there's 2006, but that's really where it triggered. Like I would like to be competitive. I have sort of already hit the peak of Batters Up because I remember going back to Batters Up after the local that I had been referring to. And at one point I could never even get out around one or two but at this point, even without competitive decks, I was pretty reliably winning because it just wasn't a very competitive scene. And I remember I showed up with a Cyberstein deck with Cyber Dragons and the Borgs cards that I wasn't really playing before. And then not only was I winning, it was just kind of like crushing the competition because now my yeah. deck was actually super competitive. I wasn't very good, but I was playing what I saw off metagame. Yep. And at that point, it sort of reached the peak. I, I can't really progress as a player in Batters Up and I needed to look elsewhere. And for me, the next store, a little bit further away, was in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is actually the city that I went to college in, so it's a pretty important city for me. But there was a store there, Larry's, and it was at Larry's that I went into a little bit more of a competitive scene. The tournaments were way bigger than they were going on at Batters Up. And in Larry, or at Larry's, it's where I met Paul Clark. It's where I met CJ Lack. Ah, uh, yes. I would eventually meet Jimmy Johnson. I'd get introduced to Duelist Grounds. I mean, all of these Im- just massive, important events in my career happened at Larry's. And when I went to Larry's, I started getting crushed again. It was like, okay, great. Yeah. You know, I-, I had reached the peak of Batters Up, I won every week. Now I'm going to Larry's. It's like, this is the big yard. Like This is the next level. And I'm getting crushed every week again. That first so feeling, 
when you started getting crushed again, was that exciting or, or depressing or a little bit of both? I think, I mean, I remember the first deck I ran there. I, I built this sort of wave motion burn deck sort of built off of a deck that Max Suffrage used at a Shonen Jump years prior called Countdown Control. So I had this sort of Clock Tower Prison Wave Motion deck that I put a lot of work into. It's actually one of the reasons why my original name on Duelist Grounds was Wave Motion, because I was just, I loved this idea of a deck that had Clock Tower Prison in a format with only a couple back row removal cards. And I just got crushed, and I don't think it really was sort of depressing or anything, but it definitely forced me to say, okay, enough of this you know, off-the-grid <laughs> burn deck. I should probably start to actually play yeah. real deck. I want to say something. Uh, you mentioned how metagame was like the beginning of you pretty much becoming competitive. And I I think it's interesting how you and I, our past pretty much mirrors each other. Like everything you're saying, it's almost like you are saying verbatim what my life was leading up to me becoming a competitive player. I mean, literally finding out about metagame, going home, reading every single article, looking at every single player, looking at all the deck lists, every, like everything they had to offer, right? And becoming completely obsessed with it. And then they had a... Yep. Shonen Jump Championship in Philadelphia that I went to. Obviously, I scrubbed out and I see like the people who I'm seeing on Metagame in person for the first time. I didn't go up to them or anything like that because I was just, you know, shy and didn't want to be weird. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, but it was like they're a celebrity. Yes, they were literally to us, to us Yu Gi Oh players growing up, they were celebrities. And it's so strange how life works because you and I go on to later become the article writers in the community and like. The people who are top. No, it is the, amazing. It yeah. is, it's so interesting to think like we became the people who are topping every event. I mean, like I said, you have one of the longest YCS top streaks in history. How how many YCS did you top in a row? Seven. Yeah, that's what? that's insane. That is pretty yeah, it's insane. hard to think. Topping yeah, seven, so. topping seven YCS right now in a row is I want to say it's almost impossible just because of the very Christian Urena. I haven't followed enough, but Christian Arena is basically that, plus actually can win them, which I was never able to do. Yeah, so he, won it is the, uh, he did win a YCS right before quarantine, I believe. I think he won yeah. him and Hani. I think, I think yeah, they won the, the team one, right? I, I don't know for sure because I wasn't actively playing. But yeah, I think I think that they yeah, I think they won together. And I know that he definitely topped a lot of events in a row, but I'm not sh I'm not sure he could have topped more than seven in a row maybe but that's not easy to do regardless, i mean regardless we're only talking about accolades right and it's only one other person that i could think of. i mean if he is that right i think simon he is probably high up there in yeah terms but of, there's a uh there's an I'm asterisk just, i'm just, I'm just <laughs> look he's just stating the facts there's an asterisk on that one adam probably too if you actually counted adams in a row and there's an asterisk on that one like, as well you got any more for me joe <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine pat has a lot in a okay, row okay pat Pat, yes. I think Pat probably is, you know, obviously he's one of the GOATs. He's one of the absolute best players of all time. But He might just be the GOAT. But I, was just, I don't want to take Adam, away from you. I was just you. watching your video. Uh, your your video on Adam Corn Monarchs. Yep. Oh, okay, on that one I posted. I'm actually, I have it recorded. I just have to edit it and upload it. It'll be up this weekend. I have Adam Salvo Dad deck profile ready to go too. So nice. I definitely yeah, got him a few times. Speaking of like everybody being a player, I was always a Monarch player. I, I tried to play Monarchs in every format I could. So uh, yeah, it was an interesting video. Yeah, Fun like little those, trick on memory. The memory Yu -Oh! history video, videos are great because I've, so every video that you've done so far, I've actually, I recognize the format. I played them. I was there. So to me, the nostalgia is great because I remember like, oh, <laughs> this mm. is, we're talking about Salvo Dad. I was actually, first of all, I played Salvo Dad at the 2009 Nationals. Like that is the deck that I switched to like, a week or two before that actual event. That's just when it started leaking out. As yep, a deck. it leaked, and that's how I got it. It leaked, and I copied the deck list, and I played it at locals, and I thought it was so good, even though it really wasn't. Uh, and I, I even told myself that Adam probably isn't going to play this for nationals now because it, you know it leaked. I thought that he was going to mm -hmm. switch to something else, but he actually ended up playing it and obviously doing very well with it. Uh, but what didn't he do well with? So it, it, it didn't really say much about. The deck, it more so was like, well, Adam's just a phenomenal player regardless, and he could probably be anybody with anything. Anything. So I point this out in the deck profile that I'm going to post soon, but three did top the final SJC in Indy, three out of 16. Okay. If you consider that a four deck format of Light Sworns, GBs, Black Wings, and Cat, and then you add Salvo Dad, theoretically, they would all get three spots out of 15. Yeah. If it's just an even cut. Spread, yeah. And they did technically get three out of 16 in that final one. That's pretty good. So. Maybe if the format progressed, it, it would have slotted in as the fifth deck on a... Yeah. I, I don't think it was quite on the level of Cat and the others, but... Yeah, that's what I was going to... Look, that's what I mean. I don't think that in, in hindsight, and even when I was actually playing, I wasn't good in 2009, but I kind of yeah, knew 
Yeah, I kind of knew though after I, I scrubbed out at nationals. The way I lost, I, I realized that the deck just wasn't as good as just it's something as simple as cat, right? Like cat was just yeah, it was ridiculous. so simple. I just watched a video <laughs> where you played a match playing against Solidat with cat, and you kind of just like trivialized him. I mean, both the games you won, I'm pretty sure they were like one turn. <laughs> yeah, game one and I three. Think I could have won game were, two, but yes, game two was interesting because you top deck my control after you, you set your area bellum so that that yeah you probably yeah could've... remember that decision point where i was like i could yeah. buy i was like I, you know if i set air bellum and it dies that's the fifth monster for the avarice and yep. then i'll have three fresh cards and i feel like i can work with three cards this is only bad if i drop mind control yep. and i drew mind control yeah i was sort it, of it, I, don't I, know. I still think you played it right though i don't think that you can because having three draws guaranteed next turn i think is is too good but i don't want to get... also can just beat me this is dark strike format yes <laughs> he, he could just, just kill you yes as you did him uh, game one and game yeah. three, you literally just killed him. So guys, check out spell. check out Joe's latest video on Yu-Gi-Oh! History, the YouTube channel, where he plays Salvo Dad versus uh Cat. He's playing Cat against Salvo Dad, but you can see how the Salvo Dad deck functions for the most part. Didn't get to see some of the more explosive things that I can do because that's how good the cat deck was. It just kind of kills you. It doesn't give you time to set up and do all your little Cyber Valley tricks and all that stuff. You kind of just die. If I remember it's, correctly, it's specifically it's YGO underscore history. Yep, right? that is the technical name if you honestly just type in my last name you'll be able to find my channel yeah i, I do have my name attached to every video no oh, that's um cool. being someone so, that covers a lot um uh hold on i still my art right, reset <laughs> um being somebody that covers a lot of um formats and history of you give do you have a favorite format or a format that you would think about most fondly i get asked this question a lot and it's just to a point where i enjoy anything that i lived through I mean, I could go back and yeah. play even formats that in at the moment people hated, like 2010 Nationals with Infernities, Frog FTK, and X Sabers, and I, I would really enjoy that. I would enjoy that so much more than modern. Like if you tell me memories, the Pasadena, right? it's honestly just the way the game is played. You could tell yeah. me, would you rather Pasadena be modern Yu-Gi-Oh format or 2010 Nationals? I'd pick 2010 Nationals. You can you can Frog FTK me, but most games, even the Infernity deck, the X Saber deck, at least we'll have four or five turns. That's interesting. I would play any old format over modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Well, you may get your wish because, they, I mean, I know that this past week they announced that they're going to start doing like older format stuff. And I, I saw your Facebook post. You don't really think that it's going to go anywhere, honestly. And I, I, I understand that. Uh, I will want to be optimistic about it and say that maybe one day we will get a previous season YCS or something, right? Like maybe one day there will be or maybe even at a YCS, we'll get a huge side event that draws on a lot of people to an older format. So, Kenny... I don't know if you saw, but Konami like yeah, did. actually announced old formats are a thing. Now. One of my locals is having a tournament Sunday. Already, yeah. shit. They're already doing Go Control. Yep, that's well, the most popular one. Even that's though a good place not to start. That's a good place to start. It though. is a good place to start. So, to get people's feet wet. Yeah. The problem is, I feel like they needed to address. They, it, you can just say, okay, we're going to play by the same rulings that of the time period. Okay, sure, but we can't find modern Yu-Gi-Oh rulings. Are you sure that people are just going... To, like, if I show up to that tournament and I discard three Thunder Dragons, or, like, I do the one discard, get two, and then later in the game I need light, so I just discard two Thunder Dragons, and the opponent's like, you can't just discard Thunder Dragon to search zero. And I say, yeah, you could back in 2005. What are they going to yeah, take my word for it? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Take out Pojo. I mean, at least yeah. with GOAT format, there is a community that's already sort of created an unofficial database of the rules at the time. But if you play other formats and I say, you know, with, with my crush, I get to look at your hand with this, even if you discard cards, I usually take my word for it because I, I lived it. But what about six months prior where they changed the way that card was ruled or oppression? And there's like a very particular date and time where oppression went from you have to always preemptively flip it to you can just one for one dad with it. That's a pretty important deal. And that people one are gonna was play these huge. Formats, the one where they told yeah, you had to flip up in oppression before they even special summit was huge. Yeah, so. Those are good points because without having like a judge or a knowledgeable player or person that lived through those formats, it's going to be really hard to to handle those rulings. I don't want people to get turned off because they show up and they maybe they didn't even know that brain control had a different text. You know, like if you just that, have played modern, why would you know that? That's true. So if Every you start card playing, has a seven erratas, and your opponent plays brain control and then plays it like it's two thousand five brain control, and you say, "Wait, what?" I, I get that that's easy to fix. The person can go home and realize it. But I don't think they should have that unpleasant experience to be forced to learn the way 2005 worked if they could have at least put together something that definitively laid out the commonly used cards and interactions and whatnot so that people could reference it ahead of time. I think it could save an issue. Now, it could just be growing pains and older play or newer players playing these old formats they've never played. We'll just get over it. They'll learn the rulings, the erratas. And after a month, I mean, it's that's what they Maybe have to do right now. <laughs> 
maybe that because well it is if i if my local is going to have one sunday and there's no official database besides sort of the informal one out there as to how goat format works well we'll see what happens yeah i hope people like it i mean i, I, I said this will. i said this I forget to whom or into what context, but if there's one retro YCS a year, even just one, I would probably give up modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Because I can only likely go to one YCS plus nationals every year as is. And mm. basically just focus on modern Yu-Gi-Oh! around I nationals. I would fucking love and, that. That'd yeah, really I would just cool. I would just give I up modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Would love, I would play, so I would play. That would bring me back to Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm not even gonna lie. I, can't. I, I, would, go, I would go to the local retro tournaments every week instead because it's more fun, it's more enjoyable. And I would just forego modern if, you get if no at problem. the start of if every I can only year, play one event a year if, if at the start of every year konami said okay in let's say june, june or july right the time pretty much after nationals we're all kind of not doing anything anyway there's no events after mm-hmm. after nationals there's going to be a 2009 nationals format ycs like they tell you in january exactly what the format's going to be so that everyone has the same amount of time to test for mm-hmm. it, you know, in between, like, let's say the format gets stale in January. Because, like, at this point, we're not getting a new pack like we were supposed to get before Pasadena. So the format's going to stay Sword Soul, Bird Up, and those are pretty much like the decks right now. Like, I'm not even going to go into all the other decks that are possible to play. Those are the two There's decks. Of them. There's a lot. You can play anything right now. You can pretty much kill your opponent turn one. But for the most part, it's going to be Sword Soul and Bird Up going into Pasadena and probably after Pasadena since we're not getting anything changing and assuming no ban list. So people get bored. We'll of, have a ban list right after Pasadena. Well, yeah, 17th we'll, is the earliest possible day. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Because <laughs> uh, the ban list haven't been very real lately. I don't know if you noticed that part, uh, but they just have not, the last one didn't do anything. Like we're being, they put even a one for dry trial. Like that didn't do a single thing to that deck. Like it didn't do a single it, thing. It helped the deck actually. <laughs> yeah. In a weird way. Right. And, uh, but not to get sidetracked. The point is that we get bored of, of the current format all the time and, but we can't do anything about it. What's, what are you going to do? Play another game? Cause Yu-Gi-Oh has only supported one format in history. It's always supported advanced format. Traditional has been a meme. So if they were like, Hey, 2009 nationals is going to be the YCS this year. In between those weird moments where you're just, I'm tired of playing Sword Soul, you'd be like, you know, let's whip out our Asabo Dan decks. Let's whip out our Cat decks. Let's, uh, let's sure. whip out our Lightsword decks. That would be so fun. And I would actually play Yu-Gi-Oh! again. So that's the best case scenario. It's that's, obviously that's not the case. most likely scenario, yeah. but, you know, if they did it right, one of the problems is they don't have the events because of COVID to likely gather the data of interest by running these at the side events of YCSs that are, maybe they will do this at the next two YCSs. That would surprise me, but it would be sweet. I feel like they should tell us ahead of time so we can bring the cards, but let's just say for the sake of discussion, <laughs> they actually announce this ahead of time as they should. They get to see and they're like, oh, wow, we just had 300 people in a YCS that's capped just by people only going to the YCS to play, not alone. Like you can't just walk in the door because of the restrictions. And we just had three, 400 people sign up for a side event. I think that they need you. You need to be on some kind of committee, Joe. I feel like I feel like you would be a great I, you know, people aren't really happy with the current Joe in office, but I think you'd be a great Joe in office for Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, I think <laughs> I think you do a really good job on the committee because <laughs> you just seem you seem to have a really good understanding of how things should be. Like, tell us in advance so we bring the cards. That's smart. You know, it's common it's sense. Obvious, it's obvious, but listen, Konami has it is had, obvious, but Konami has made they've some had a, weird decisions. Yes, they've had a history of dropping balls. So I, you know, you need someone who's kind of like you were a player, you know, for a long time. You have kind of like this idea of how things should be structured because you're also a teacher. I think that, that skill translates into Yu-Gi-Oh. I think that the way you speak about how things should be and how organized you are is actually a skill from your teaching life that is it translates. It, it helps. It helps. Also, one event a year shouldn't be that hard to set up for fucking Konami. Like it's, you know. So it's really because it's always a business. Yes. At the end of the day. The question is, if they ran a re- retro YCS but also, let's say, an extravaganza-level Sunday modern event, would the amount of money they earn be Be sufficient? Because they basically, you can't book the Philly Convention Center and only get 400 retro players. That's true. You just can't do that. It's so expensive. Exactly. You you need to get 1,800. You do. Could Retro Yu-Gi-Oh! get to the point where an equivalent amount of people would show up to play? And in addition to that, could Konami create product to drive sales re- re- in relation to retro Yu-Gi-Oh! because yes the player quantity is part of it but they also need to be selling the products for people to go to those yep. events i think I there think- is a universe I-, I think there is a universe there's someone that commented on one of my youtube videos that said if there was one retro ycs a year and i actually had the chance of having ycs champion attached to my name i would fly from you from england yes, yes. I-, I also I think 
how many old school players who do not currently travel, have no plans on traveling, would build a deck and go to one of these events? I, I think you would actually have a, a decent foundation just off the bat. Could then content creators like PAC, for example, and others build up interest? And then could the local scene actually get going? And honestly, in my locals yesterday, people were playing Edison. People were trading. People like, I saw in a trade, how much do you value this ultimate ring of destruction? People were trading for, talking about, talking about ideas. They were a lot of retro Yu-Gi-Oh! discussion to my locals yesterday. If that's a blip in the radar, then this won't go anywhere. But if we see locals of an equivalent size between modern and retro, and then we can translate that through content creation and actually get interest, and Konami looks at it and says, wow, we could actually sufficiently fill the Philly Convention Center or whatever convention center you want with a retro event and make the same amount of money we would. And in addition to that, we can start to gear products in a way, right? You put, you know, ultimate rare metamorphosis or something into a pack and that could be a driving force, right? That Maybe some of these die sets. Yeah, no, I get right? what you're saying, Joe. I mean, it, it makes sense from a business standpoint. If they're going to do this type of thing, Magic does it already. I think that oh, this is the God, yes. natural evolution of Yu-Gi-Oh! Now that we're talking about it more, like the more it's coming out verbally i'm starting to realize that this is Yu-Gi-Oh's natural evolution to me is to actually support more than one format like magic does magic is years and years ahead of Yu-Gi-Oh, right like just how long it's been out it's also like now it's definitely like just a bigger game honestly like it's just a bigger game and i think that the support finally getting the support for these old formats is not only the natural evolution but there's money to be made from a business standpoint and even if at first you do have to kind of lose a little bit of money like that's just r&d right like that's just businesses have to do that anyway like konami has to do that sure. anyway you have to you're going to have r&d costs you're going to have like oh we don't know how this actually will perform we're going to we're going to do a test of it in 2022 do the one ycs see see if we get 400 or if we get 1800 and depending on how that goes then you start to tweak things maybe you only got 400 for a reason maybe because of covid maybe because people couldn't travel as much and stuff like that but or maybe you say you know what we can figure out a way to make this better and we'll create a pack like m17 for example that literally reprints cards from that format so that mm -hmm. people can play it and in a rarity that makes people who don't even care about the format but they still want the collector like the ultimate metamorphosis for example like yeah starlight metamorph yeah so I think there is a pathway where this can happen and it's profitable and it makes sense and all of that. I think it's a little bit difficult because there's this, there's the work with the erratas and the rulings and that you, you do need that database. Yeah. And our request is a little bit different from what magic has going on. The natural rotation of sets make it such that you don't actually have to tweak all that much. You basically just have to pick a certain pinpoint and yeah. time and then say these sets yeah. are legal. We actually want to play a, a timestamp in Yu-Gi-Oh yeah. because legacy and vintage sets or legacy and vintage in magic and even modern and all of those, they get affected by new card release, right? Our 2009 format is not going to be affected by a card printed in 2022 in magic, a card printed in 2022 or 2021 is going to affect vintage and legacy yep. and all of those old formats. I'm looking at you, Ragavan, right? So <laughs> it's a little bit of a different universe. It requires a little bit more work. You have to actually say, we're going to play old rulings and old erratas, but it is doable. Yep. R &D. And especially you, if you only support it, I get it. If you don't want to put 20 years and 50 different formats to that level of work, I understand if you don't actually have the manpower to actually do that. But if you pick a few segmented formats and say, we're going to devote six months to this, this is our database. And then you can add to it over time. This doesn't have to be a universe where we are, yeah. we can look at this Magic database and see every format and every ruling and every single thing ever in the history of the Magic game. The gathering wasn't built overnight. That's for sure. Well, that's the thing. Let's say, let's live in dreamland and let's say things work out. Let's say they do it once a year, right? One event a year. If they announce the event six months ahead of time or whatever, um, that's plenty of time for everybody to start figuring out the rulings, figuring out how everything works before the event comes up. Another thing they can do in terms of gaining interest, uh, prize cards, something that could be cool. Let's say the format is, Ooh. um, let's say the, let's say the format is, uh, 2010, um, Gravekeepers, the Atlanta YCS, the Frazier one, right? Let's say, okay, we're going to do this format. The prize card for that event could be a re, like a new art of a Gravekeeper card, right? Like if they do each format a YCS, you can make the prize card of the event. Yeah, that means new art for this this card, this boss card of this deck that won. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely I don't even do stuff like that. I don't really think the prize card drives all that much. I don't know about it. You, it does. But... It does now because they're worth a lot of money now. I don't know. 
So when we played, sure, I guess that's true. When we played, they were not worth really anything. But now we played for intrinsic motivation. We we really did. We played because we loved the game. But now people Mm -hmm. could be argued that they play for the actual price. For example, they just gave out Ultra Dark Lords recently for I think a remote something, a remote YCS or something like that. They gave the winner Ultra Rare Dark Lords, the same prize card that I won in 2010. They gave it to someone else. It is now worth tens of thousands of dollars. Like that, like that prize card, those prize cards, I should say, is the only triple, but it's worth tens of thousands of dollars now. It's not, it's no longer when I saw Oh, I know. I might make a new art, a little bit. A new art exclusive Dark Magician. That shit's going to, people are going to be like, they're going to want that shit. They're going to want it. Yeah, that'll bring people out. I mean, if there's incentive, like money incentive definitely gets people. It definitely motivates a lot of magic players. Um, but but you you need your casuals as well. You know, you always, no matter what, you're not gonna be able to run a scene on just competitive players, unfortunately. You need the people who are just they're not they're not gonna win the tournament. They kind of know that they're not gonna win, but they just kind of show because they like to play the old format. You need those yeah, people I was about too. To say, I think I think there are casual players that may might not travel, but if they live in the area. Yeah. They will go. You could have a person that say like, "Oh, this is Yu-Gi-Oh the way I grew up." I'll go play. I'd, I would go for sure. I wouldn't travel like Fraser saying he would travel. Yep. I, I would wouldn't travel. travel. I wouldn't travel to Atlanta to California. But if they have one in Pennsylvania, I would go. To you would go one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, what we're talking about, or is even very even good. in New York or New Jersey, like in my surrounding area, PA, New York, New Jersey, I'd go to any of those places. I'm not taking a flight though. Yeah. One thing that I thought of that. I obviously don't work for Konami, so I don't have any of the inner workings of this, but they stopped running SJCs or YCSs at Gen Con. Yes, they And do. to my knowledge, it had to do with the entry fee and having to pay $100 for a badge and all that. If there was a retro YCS, a $100 badge for Gen Con, which is actually a really awesome four days in and of itself, is not going to stop retro players from playing. And they used to run extravaganzas there. So if they had, and if you knew ahead of time, every Gen Con is a retro YCS. At Gen Con for Magic, they at least have historically, I don't know how recent it is, but they've done, you know, like a vintage or whatever the set is where you can use Black Lotus and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've, actually, done, yeah, they've, they, done they've actually had the, yeah, they have these one-off, once a year, crazy, yep. let's play our Black Lotuses in person, not just online type events. It's the Thieves' Guild favorite time have, of the year. Could Yu-Gi-Oh have a YCS? So we need that word, YCS, or that... Yes, that, the prestige. You need, to, you need to have the prestige of it actually mattering to that level. You need to be able to say you have a YCS top or a win because that is a driving force. It would be so really... fucking cool to say I won a YCS for like 2012 or something. You know, like mm-hmm. just the idea of being a YCS champion from an older format sounds cool to me. Like that just sounds, you mastered Even an old format. Once a year, I feel like you would have, I would go, you would go. I can imagine Do you know what, so many what older love, players. The part that I would love about this is that we would be breaking these formats with our hindsight oh yeah like we we would hindsight because none of the decks that that won in the past nope. are correct they're all wrong every single one of them every single deck that has, yeah every deck that has ever won i mean I, I go back so far because i remember no one played upstar goblin and you could just correct the decks with just starting there like just correct them with putting three upstarts in every format that is viable just do that your deck is marginally better than like most of the other players in the field. And that's just like the smallest, tiniest thing. Trap Dust Shoot wasn't played for years, right? Like you see- So people... that's an easy one. That's an easy one. I think Upstart's overrated. I would, I love Trap Dust Shoot. Yes, up, but <laughs> but my, and my point, we aren't going to go into specific cards, but because the point is that we could break these formats now oh, yeah. with our hindsight. Now, like we have so much knowledge that didn't exist. Like YouTube is a phenomenal resource for players. It's the reason why the average player now is so much better than the average player when you and I played. These channels oh, that yeah. exist now, these combo videos that exist now, they didn't exist when you and I were learning these things on the spot, basically. Um, and then the card choices, Not really. yeah, they just it just wasn't really a thing. And now you have it's 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 interesting how much information there is. And you have Dueling Book now, which didn't really exist. You know, we had Dueling Network, but that came that even that came later, right? Like that didn't exist in Goat format. There was no there was no. No, it came Network. up during. Well, there was YVD, but that was some. Yeah, and that was such a small, 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 small part of the community that used that. Like that was I extremely mean, small. You go on Dueling Book it, right now, and there are thousands of people oh on yeah. right at this very moment. There are th- tens of thousands of people right now at this very moment. It's crazy. Yeah, why did he was for online warring, basically? Yes, the duelist but that's days, met, the Pojo days. Jimmy Johnson. That's where I met some important. I mean, Pat started introduced on Duelist Grounds to me. Like, yeah, getting introduced to Duelist Grounds is huge. Yeah, because I mean, honestly, that's where I met 
online. It's where I met Pat. It's where I met so many people. I could yeah. li- literally Jeff just... used to post on Duelist Grounds. Jeff actually Jeff posted met... his deck list. Like his winning deck list got posted on there before he won with it. Matt Peddle used to be on there. Conspire was his username. Mm-hmm. Let's see. There, every they, Austin was Austin Coleman was on there. Everyone is on there. I, I mean, would love. I the, the thought of this is making me so happy. Uh, and it's sad because, like, you know, realistically, we already said this is best case scenario. This is probably not none of this realistically is going to happen yet. Like, not 2022 because that's really early. I'm so optimistic though, and the feeling that I'm getting, the nostalgia that's coming over me right now, makes me so happy at the thought of it. Though, like, I really want this to happen. It would be really so cool. much needs to go right. But it's not zero percent. It's not zero yeah. percent. I think one of the one of the problems you mentioned how Wizards Wizards does a lot of really good things for the community. One benefit that Wizards has over Konami is that, at least for us, the American audience, is that Wizards of the Coast is stationed in America. So yeah, the way Konami, because not even just Konami, but the way Japan, the culture, we have a lot of culture difference. I play a lot of fighting games. In America, it is very standard that if you go to a fighting game tournament, it's best two out of three. And then top eight is best three out of five. But in Japan, a lot of their fighting game tournaments are just best of one. Like for the whole tournament up until top eight, it's just best of one in the arcade. All right, you're out of here. And so there's there's just different cultural divides of the way these two communities run things. I know the Japanese and uh, American Yu-Gi-Oh community has been very different for a long time. So I think that's one of the problems is that we can't, we don't have many good ways of directly interacting with Konami to tell them like, hey, this is what would make it work better yeah you're right about that because they actually have one round you play one game they have ycs's in japan as the equivalent of a ycs i guess where you do play one game i just found out about this last thursday at locals like they everyone plays one game you play so uh, apparently in these formats everyone just plays ftks because why yeah. not it's crazy i never heard that yeah like why be honest right like why try to play an honest deck when you can just i'm trying to win turn one so everyone's playing yeah. pretty much a turn one kill you type deck. i think i heard about a there's i don't i can't remember the name of the, the youtube channel but i do remember watching a Yu-Gi-Oh youtube channel that would discuss certain decks in japan that would win those like one round ycs's or like not you know what i mean by one round yeah, yeah. uh best of one ycs's and like one year like an exodia deck one and everybody's like oh my god this exodia deck's going to take over and the guy had explained like this was this was a, a, a best of one format. <laughs> like this Exodia deck is not viable in yeah. real Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we do have some uh, some roadblocks. I mean, Konami Japan is different from the U.S. Konami, and uh, from what I understand, they are essentially the ones who can dictate what can and cannot be done for even us. So, despite the fact that this may be a great idea for Americans and everyone over here in the TCG, if they don't see an incentive to, because they have to make packs, like they have to. This is not going to work without the business side. It, it won't just be like, oh, we want to do something for the community. It always has to be we're selling you something. And mm-hmm. the good thing is, here's what I will say, because we've been talking about like a lot of the, the roadblocks. I think that we've gotten older. Like we're now in our 30s, all of us, like all of the people who are greats from the past. We're all 30 years old now. And we have we have money now, like all of us. I think that it's fair to say that all of us pretty much just have money where things that used to cost a lot don't really have the same feel. So like when you were saying paying $100 for a Gen Con badge. When I was 15, that's a lot because I have to have a hotel, I have to get there, and then I also have to pay for this badge. So it's no surprise that back then, in Yu-Gi-Oh's infancy, that you'd only get 400 players at 2010 Indianapolis Gen Con YCS. That makes sense to me because we were young and we had to you know, mostly get money from our parents and things like that. But now we're like full flesh adults living lives People have a lot more money, I noticed. when like I've come back to the community this, this year and everyone just buys these expensive-ass cards like it's nothing, but we're, I just noticed that we're all, we all have real jobs now. Like everyone just has a career and they work, they like make real money. So when it's like, oh, I want this Starlight Straddles for 500, people are just like, I'll demo you 500. I'm like, holy shit. Like cars, yeah. didn't, regular cars didn't just cost 500 when we were playing. Like that, that was, was a whole deck. Like, yeah, that was a whole yeah, deck. Sure. And it's, it's interesting now how much money people, like to just the disposable income that we have access to. But I always thought when I was younger, Magic the Gathering players, I used to always say when I tried to trade with them, it was so hard because they didn't want anything. And I didn't realize it was because they were just older than me. They had yeah. careers. They had money. I would go up at my locals to, when I played Magic in 2010, Jace the Mind Sculptor. A guy would have eight of them. And I would say, how much? And he would tell me, I don't want your money. Like blatantly. It wasn't about money because he had money. Like he didn't need a hundred, whatever it cost. He didn't need a hundred dollars. It didn't mean anything. And so now we have a lot more money. So we can travel now. We can afford these old cards because uh, a lot of them are really expensive. Yesterday, one of my friends, Brian, showed me three super rare Gravekeeper Spies. And I said, how much are they? And he was like, they're like three to 400 each. 
which is fucking absurd. And guess what? He probably moved them that night too. It's just, it's just crazy the amount of disposable income that people have now because we're all older and we would be the main people who would be playing these formats anyway. If we're being honest. And once again, if you give them six month, six months notice, like Joe said, that gives everybody with jobs time to say, Hey, I'm taking off on this day, six months from now. Yeah. And you can play the common version of like, you know, if you're playing 2009 national format with dark strike fighter, you can just play the lowest rarity of it. And I'm sure it's cheap. You know, I have a bunch of old format decks just built. Because they're all commons. You are the and I have them historian. in big boxes. I just carry them around to locals. Sometimes if people want to play old formats, like, yeah, I got like 12 decks right here. They're all I would, commons. They're I all, would be concerned if yeah. you didn't have that. <laughs> yeah, it's super easy. I will say this, Joe. I noticed when I was watching your channel that uh, you have some really high rarity shit in your collection. <laughs> When you show well, up those decks, they are very. I was like, "Holy shit, that's a thousand, that's eight hundred, that's five hundred each." <laughs> I'm looking at your, I'm looking at your videos. Like Joe got some bread in these cards. Like you have some money in these cards. So, to my defense, <laughs> back in the day, those cards did not cost that much. They did. <laughs> no, they was did like not. Three for a hundred. Let's say Gravekeeper's Buy, for example. Yep. And I mean, back in the day, I preferred to run high rarity decks. A lot of people did. Yeah. And high rarity decks. 10 years ago weren't that expensive basically one starlight today you think of someone who buy a 500 hundred dollar starlight that was like a whole high rarity deck back yes in the day. yeah and there were so many staples that were applicable right yes today there's imperm and whatnot but back in the day it's like if you had bottomless that's great it covers all your decks you have your super bottomlesses super book of moons yeah. super it just covers everything yeah i had all of those cards back yeah. in the day and i just don't like trading those particular cards part of it's sentiment like sentimentality like oh this was a card that was in a deck that i topped with or i got my first regional then I, I don't really want to move it because of that so i just stick it in a binder and then obviously 10 years later they're all worth a ton of money but i cannot believe that 10 years very, has actually passed. very few of the cards that i profile with i've actually had to go get there are some don't get me wrong but like tp2 jar i've had that for 10 years tp4 yeah. decrees i've had those for probably 15 years i've had these cards for very 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 yeah. long time and i just tend not to be the type of person to trade a lot of those type of cards so i, I already have three it. ultimate alerts i had them in Dark Arm Return format. They're the same three that I had then that I have now. They're worth so much now. Everything's worth so much more. So your collection that you've, like you said, you're not really a trader. You just kind of collect the things because you like them at the time. And it benefited. Particularly Champion Pack. It's like I have three super threatening roars. I have the same three super threatening roars that I used in my Nationals deck with Light Swarns in 2009. They are the same cards. Yeah. And they just keep going up. I just, I just don't trade them. Yeah. I have the same end. play set of super mind crushes that I had. When I cited that card, it just doesn't change. We get it, Joe. You're rich. All right. <laughs> we get it. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to say that, you know, <laughs> no, if you I see know. these cards, they're like, wow, he's spending all this money on Yu Gi Oh! It's like, I don't really spend no, that on, on Modern. Well, years. that's the thing. So I know you personally, and I know, you know, all of us, honestly, the whole ARG team, we all had a lot. Like, I think that when I think about the one of the original ARG teams, like me, you, Pat, Jeff, Billy, Alex Van Sant, Cordero, all of us just had Alistair. Alistair. We all just had collections. Like all of us, we all just had cards. And if we needed cards, we'd be like, oh, you could borrow this, you could borrow that, whatever. But like, we all just had cards and a lot of us have stopped playing at the same time. Or, you know, you stopped before I did. And then I stopped for the last five years, basically. And I don't really get rid of my cards. Like I don't, I don't actively trade or anything like that. Um, so I have the same thing going on just quietly because I don't have a YouTube page showing them. But when I was watching yours, I was like, holy shit, like this guy has some <laughs> heat. But it's it, like a lot of us have come up nicely just because we happen to be collectors in the past who didn't trade. I never really saw incentive to trade back in the day. Like after a certain I point, I was like, I'm I traded. I just wouldn't trade certain cards. My original like okay these are my three whatever yeah like my place out of this if i had four sure i'll trade the fourth but yeah i, I started yeah. i got to a point where i hated trading i hated it as soon as i started working i think as soon as i started working when i graduated college i started working a the real job work goes away well when there's people this... would haggle me over five dollars i would get so impatient with that i would just close my binder and take it back there it gets to a point too where you maybe when you're like 14 15 16 years old you could be like i'm gonna trade and i'm gonna i'm gonna make out i'm, I'm gonna like rip people up but it's like you have this mindset of like oh man i need to trade for the <laughs> submit card like i need to go two ups in value and then it gets to a point where it's like i almost feel immoral trying to do this i'm like 20 and this person's 15 and i'm trying to trade like yeah Juice. i just get to a point where it's almost like i just want to trade fairly at my age now 
That's and interesting, Joe. I'm glad that you felt that not, way. Yeah, because not everybody. I, not listen, everyone I know, feels that way. I know when I was at locals, there were some adults trying to juice the fuck yeah. out of me. Yeah, <laughs> just juicing trying was to a way juice of life. Me. That was a way of life. It, it, it happened to me when I was younger, and then certainly probably yeah. in my teenage years, it was always that you know, what? How many good trades can I get? And don't get me wrong, if you're 25 and you're training with a 25 year old, and they don't realize a yeah. retro car that they have worth a lot. That's like only, I can understand yeah. the gray area there. But if you're like hounding the 14 year old who just opened their OTS yeah, pack and got and I've seen that. Firm, definitely it's seen like, that. okay, it's don't a give weird. them a $5 card for that $200 card. There is some degree of morality here. Yeah, it is weird. It's like, it's just, yeah, it's just weird. You're 10 years older than them and you're just like, yeah, so uh, what are you doing? With I've seen a ton of older men hound an actual 10 year old at a sneak preview before. Yeah, it's super weird. I've seen it too. It's so funny when you see yeah. it. It's just like, and you fuckers better not pull up any pictures of me being one of the ones hounding that kid either i will i will cancel all of you <laughs> but yeah i've seen grown men hound the kid over a moulin glacier like hound them i've got a quick question for both of you guys because i think both of you can relate to this um at some point you become a good enough player where if you go to an event and you don't have a deck you can just borrow a whole deck from somebody do you know right now Yes. All of my friends, every time I go to locals, they all try to give me a deck to play every single week. Like, I'm going to well, go tomorrow was, night. That's actually funny, because I was going to ask, do you think with the price of cards now, you could that could happen today? Yes, because I, I'll be borrowing a modern deck, and they don't really cost as much. It's strange. Okay. The, the yeah. modern decks, like, right, I, asked, I actually asked Steven Silverman last Thursday, how much is a Sword Soul deck? Because my one friend... He came to locals with me for the first time ever. He's like, I want to play Yu-Gi-Oh. I was like, you, you really don't? But I'm going to let you... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you come shadow me to locals. And you'll see if you want to really play it. So he came and we were asking about how much the decks cost. And so Silverman said, you know, a source sold deck is like four to five hundred. Like the lowest rarity. Here's a deck. Um, four to five hundred is what you probably pay for it. And I was like, that's actually not too bad. Cause a Stratos Starlight is literally that or more. Uh so modern decks don't cost as much. It's when people are talking like max rarity, that's where it gets really bad. Like the Appaloosa Starlight is a lot. That's in every deck. Uh, stuff like that gets really, really, you know, out of out of hand, <laughs> to say the least. I don't expect to borrow someone's Starlight Rare or anything, but if we're talking about, I just need this Sword Soul deck for an event. I could get a Sword Soul deck for Pasadena if I wanted to and play it, and no one would bat an eye. But one, I know a lot of people, so that's probably easy in that regard. And two, people just have a lot of extra cards now. I don't know what the hell's going on. Funny. Just I, funny. I let's just say that there are a few years where I'd go to an event without really preparing for it i'd just go to the event and people would lend me decks yeah for yeah. sure so yeah. i remember i went to the ycs in toronto with zoo okay and I, I didn't own any drydens or barrages but whether it was Furman or ned or a combination of the two yep. plus a few others like silverman like yeah your friends would lend you cards the same way that i would lend people cards back in the day yeah yep. I, I, there's still cards that i never got back i have a list in my phone i just i just wrote it off i'm just like this is i'm never getting these cards back Dude, put it as a tax write-off. Like, I just... <laughs> a tax write-off. <laughs> it's just so many cards that I lent out in the past, and it's... what Like, I, at this point, I'm like, it's immaterial. It's fine. Like, none of them are... It's not like I lent out super rare Mind Crushers or super rare Gravekeeper Spies. You know what I mean? Like, the stuff that I lent was like, oh, a Felgrand here and there, a Shared Ride here and there. And like, yes, those cards have definitely jumped up and down over the years since I've lent them out, but I don't really care. It's just kind of the way the game is. Like, the community, if you know enough people, you have good friends, you can definitely just show up and borrow a deck and i'm gonna get past it tomorrow in fact last night my friend tried to give me his deck to play like we showed it to locals and he was like here you play my round and i was like i can't do that i was like one i i'm literally not you for one so your opponent's gonna be like well you're not him that's the first thing and let's just say he let me play i don't even know what i'm really doing like i kind of know but i don't know are you playing pasadena no no i'm not playing i i literally so i'm booked to, i'm going to pasadena i will be in california but i'm actually going to california one, because all of you get people are going to be there and I'm going to have a lot of fun doing that, but mainly because it's going to be a vacation for me. I'm going to use every YCS as a vacation. My job has unlimited PTO, so we can take off as much as we want as long as it gets approved. And it's basically just like, I, you're an adult. I expect you to be an adult. So you know what work you have to get done every month. I'm an accountant. So like our job is very cyclical. So I can just take off literally 10 months in a year, if I, like, te like theoretically, you know what I mean? Like obviously that would never happen, but we don't actually have a set number of days. So I'm going to go to every event. And I'm just going to use them as they're just going to be vacations for me. So I'm going to shop and eat and have fun and stuff like that. But I'm not actually playing the game. But I am interested in how you guys are going to be performing who are playing. And, you know, if there's any spicy tech that weekend, of uh, this deck is busted. You know, I love that. I miss that stuff. I miss showing up Friday to an event and everyone's in a in a lobby of the Y. You, you remember, Joe, like everyone's talking and 
there's like rumors going around of like, oh, did you hear that chain disappearance vanishes from the extra deck this weekend? And just crazy yep. shit. All types of stuff. Uh, yeah, those were fun days. Yeah, I missed that. I missed those Fridays where everybody's trying to figure out what's Jeff playing. I heard Jeff has some crazy deck. Or like, oh, <laughs> Billy has like the, the nut list for plants. So I just, I miss. That's I how miss I taught that. my first YCS. I, I was in the hotel lobby watching Billy's Red and Blue Samurai. Is that what happened? Really? That's, he didn't know who I was. <laughs> Let's say a year later, I'd be on his team and he'd be staying I'm, at my house for a YCS right, in Providence. But at that time, I know who Billy was because everybody did, but he yes. had no idea who I was. I was just a random with no YCS tops watching his deck. I'm like, wow, that's a crazy combo. And the thing was, people thought you needed two reds and two blues, but you only needed one blue in your deck. So mm-hmm. it was one less, I would say break, but one less combo piece the way that he would do the combo or so just the way the combo could have been done that nobody really realized. And I just copied the combo. And that's nice. the first YCS ever. Wow. Topped. I played that YCS because that was the first YCS after I won. And I tried, you know, everyone yeah. tries to go back to back. I got screwed. Guess who I played round four? Who'd you play with Nazar? I, I played him in top 32. You played Fraser round right? four. Wait, did we actually fucking I play? 100%. Because you had just won. Oh, and I didn't shit. Re- back in the day, I did not normally go 3 0 at YCS. So going 3 0, and then I'm like, oh my God, I have to play. Wow. The champ. I have to play the. And then. Yeah. It was a mirror match. You were running Samurai, and yep. I remember I won. And that was a big confidence boost because yeah. having never, even 4 0, I had never gone 4 0 to Ice. Do yes. you know? Having just that beat you? After you beat me, I, I lost immediately again to Brandon Wigley, who I just beat to get to the finals of the YCS. Wow, that's crazy. So he beat me right after. I won game one, too, against him. Like, it's actually crazy. I won game one, and he was, I could feel the energy. Like, he was pissed because he was thinking, like, this fucking guy, I haven't won a game on this. At that time, I had been technically three games on him, right? Like, he, yeah. hasn't, he hasn't beaten me a game to this point. And he's probably thinking to himself, like, this can't be happening again. But then he ends up backdoor 2 0 me. He he was so happy. And I don't blame him because, like, the way he lost to me in the YCS. You know, I just wrote tribute to his hand away. So <laughs> he didn't yeah, really right. get to play. He didn't get to play. But yeah, uh, that is where we played. I also played Sam Pedigo that mat that event. So I two future teammates on ARG. I damn, played. Damn, I forgot about and Sam. I, Sam's one of the I, greats. That's really he was cool. really I like good. That. I like those interactions where you're like, Yeah, I, I watched this guy, he didn't even know who I was. I, I played against <laughs> Fraser. He didn't you took know everything I was. from me. I don't even and know who you cool. are. Later, you guys are close friends on the same team, talking to each other, you know, frequently. That is amazing. Something cool interesting we all became teammates and you couldn't put that together looking at how it all like it, it just it's just weird how it all came together it's actually crazy dallas is where i met jim from arg we sat waiting for our table at a texas barbecue place the people that i went to that event with mm-hmm. and he just sort of sparked up a conversation because he realized we were Yu-Gi-Oh players and he's just generically talking about having a business and going to the events and vending and all of these things and we had just met each other and at this point I had your regional tops, but I had no YCS. I was, yeah. It's not like I was worth talking to. Yeah, no anything. reason to be sponsored, it, basically, at the time. No reason, yeah. And then I happened to top that weekend and had success in the future events, and it sort of all just happened quickly from that point. But yeah. it is funny to think about Dallas being so important because that was the, the beginning. first time I ever topped. I, we met. You might not remember. I remember that. <laughs> I'm but so sorry. It's okay. I really, no, but that, that you got to think, that event was so volatile. Uh, Samurai's was oh, a very... Yeah. I mean, that Samurai deck is pretty much a tier zero deck. Like the three oh, games. nothing touched it. Okay. I'm just want to make sure because some people don't think it was. And I'm like, it because I know Gravekeepers made it to the finals, but I don't think that that deck was good after I won. Like, I think it was bad to play it. Like, yes, you could theoretically still royal tribute someone's hand away, but you should have just been playing Samurais. At the, like, personally, I think the Samurai was so much better than every other deck mm-hmm. for that event. And I know that some 100%. Black Wings, so, you know, some Black Wings topped. I think there might have been like an anti meta deck that top 32 would but for the most part, Alistair had it. Yes. Alistair uh, topped with Anti-Meta and Sam topped with X-Sabers. And then Scott Page topped with Frog Monarchs. Yeah. Frog it, Monarchs, I could justify to Frog Monarchs because it, it was a good matchup. Yes. With Samurai Samurai's because of like Puppet Plan. Yes. Yeah. It, it, if you were going to that event, you basically play the tier zero deck or the anti tier zero yes, deck. Yes. That's exactly what you do. Alistair top because he's main decking Kinetic Soldier, which, if you don't know, when you battle, <laughs> when it battles a warrior monster, it gains like 2,000 attack. 2,000. Power. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he's well, how much does he have? Four hundred. He becomes a twenty-four, it's a, right? It's he's thirteen fifty. 50 yep, eighteen hundred. Okay, yeah, so you just huge. set it, and they crack into it, and they lose so much life points, and then you switch his ass oh, to attack yeah, mode, yeah. and you start cracking all their shit. Yeah, it plays around warning. Yeah, it's really nasty. That card can single-handedly win you the game because they might not be able to out it uh, unless they're playing red. Red and blue had an easy out to it, but or hand of the six samurai, but that's still still yeah. I mean, you're running 
20 traps running an anti-meta deck if you yeah. can't do it with a hand of six samurai then and what do you even most doing? people were playing three warnings back then that was the that was the event yeah. actually where three warnings became very very like predominant you played three warnings in the gravekeeper deck right no we played two two it wasn't custom to play three warnings back then because technically drawing warning after a monster's already established in 2010 was awful like if somebody went yeah. thunder king ryo and then you had warning yeah it was really bad, so we wouldn't play three, but because of how powerful it was in, a, in the Samurai Mirror Match, we all played three at pretty much that next slice. Like, it was... That card was... That's how I... It's not how I lost, but it is a contributing factor to why I lost against Nazar, because I remember it. It was, you know, second or third game, whatever it was, and he, he went first, and he established sort of the traditional Samurai board with the gateways and everything, and when you summon Samurais, your opponent gets counters on their gateways, which what made the Mirror Match really awkward... But I had a play where I could summon a bunch of Samurais and Mistworm his field, and I had the option, do I bounce his continuous spells so he doesn't get a million searches, or do I bounce his monsters? But because I had Warning, I figured, oh, I could just bounce all of his Samurais to hand, attack with the Mistworm, and then when he summons his first Samurai next turn, I'm just going to Warning it, yep. and then the he, could search, he could search 20 Kazans and Grandmasters. It doesn't matter. He can't summon again, but for turn, he drew Reborn. So it was like, he summons Gageki Effect, I go Warning, and then he goes Reborn Samurai, and then Splat. Use the yeah. 30 the gateway tokens that they wow. have. I was like, all right, well, that's that was crazy. Like the one. So you lost the one out. I lost to the one extender that could yep. that could actually. Yeah, he drew the one out. I mean, the warning was just that good. It was his day. It has to be your day to win. Oh, it it I always say that you need luck to win. For people who don't know, if you take nothing else from this episode of the podcast, you need luck to win a YCS. You need it. You will not win a YCS without some luck. It has never yep, happened. It needs to be your day. We're sleight of hand. You can have the best deck in the, in the whole room. You can have the absolute tier zero. No one's on this. Your deck is so far ahead. You still need luck to win at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, I mean, playing Samurai, going to an event, I didn't have any competitive advantage. I was playing a very standard Samurai deck. There was nothing special about it. I felt really, really bad about that event. I remember thinking to myself, like, really, I kind of went a negative. I was like, there's no way I'm going back to back. Like, there's no way I'm going to replicate, like, with anyone who had gone back. There was only one at the time. I think Ryan Hayakawa or something like that. I went like back to back Shonen Jump Championships way, way back in the day. I don't think anyone. I know Ryan did it. I think you are correct. Yeah, then Billy does it after me in 2000. He does like after. Yeah. Yeah, Billy does it in 2011. So back to back is like really hard to do. But obviously, everyone who wins, you know, that's like a thing that you want to try to do. But I knew my format was fucked because of Samurai, because it's such a volatile. Like when I was testing mm -hmm. for it, the testing was going back and forth with randoms at my local. Like I would just test with like random people and I couldn't really figure out a way to beat them more consistently than they were beating me. It was really, really frustrating. And I didn't know about the red blue thing. I had no idea. Yeah, about red that. and blue broke it open. Yep. Uh, and I and I I told myself that Gravekeepers was unplayable, which I still stand by. I know it made it to the finals. I think it was either Travis Messingale or Jonathan Weigel. One of those was in the finals against Nazar. He played. I against, don't recall exactly. He, yeah, he played one I of them. Check, in the, but I don't recall yeah, exactly. Nazar, his first win, he played against either Travis or Jonathan Weigel. Travis sounds about right. Yeah, I just know that they were playing. Whoever it was was playing GK, and I couldn't believe it that GK made it to the finals. Like, and almost won a second YCS, which is crazy. Yeah, he defeated oh. Travis in the final. It was Travis with GK, right? Yep. All right, there we go. I got a little Yu-Gi-Oh! history in me, too. Oh, but let yeah. me, uh, I wanted to ask real quick. This is kind of off topic from Yu-Gi-Oh! But a quick aside, because I wanted to ask Joe, you you know, you're a teacher uh, by profession. And if you don't mind answering, because um, I have a lot of respect for that profession, what, uh, what grade and what subject do you teach? This year, I have a ninth grade world history class, an 11th grade U.S. history class, and three senior AP Psych classes. Okay, nice. So I'm guessing, um, so history isn't just for Yu-Gi-Oh! History is a big part of your, <laughs> uh, your whole life. <laughs> and you could probably argue psychology a little bit there, too. Cause, yeah, you, yeah, you teach, you said, you know, AP Psych, so. Yep. That's, uh, that's pretty, what, um, like, what made you so interested in history, not only... In Yu-Gi-Oh! history, but then obviously world history, U.S. history, something has just kept you so uh, interested in in history. I don't think the interest in history from an academic sort of school perspective necessarily translates to why I find Yu-Gi-Oh! history so interesting. Okay. The, the teaching element, I think history was just always my favorite subject in school, mm -hmm. and I sort of always kind of wanted to be a teacher. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why that was the case over other professions, but it was just always something I was interested just in. something you felt. Yeah, it is a little bit of that. I you certainly knew had you some wanted teachers to be a that teacher I think, back when we were like young. You knew. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was definitely some teachers that I had throughout my schooling that I think inspired me. I think a lot of teachers would say that. But it always just sort of felt like a natural course. Back when I was really, really young, I'm talking, 
you know, 10, 11 years old, even probably younger than that. I remember I used to play school with my younger brother, I'd, you know, <laughs> give him math problems to do or something and grade him yeah. or try and teach him. So teaching just as a profession always seemed just like the natural progression. Joe, you're, you're such a nerd. In my life. <laughs> oh, it, it's so it. true. I love it. So yeah. the uh, appreciation for Yu-Gi-Oh! history, I think, is just more by virtue of the fact that I lived through so much of it. Yeah. And if I look at my life, it, it's hard to overlook how important Yu-Gi-Oh! has been, whether it was for developing sure. friendships, I love seeing the country and well, the world. And just It's, so it's much. really interesting and cool, though, that, you know, you have a Yu-Gi-Oh! history channel that and then you also <laughs> teach history. <laughs> like, it's not like you're too, your your side hustle and your hustle are directly linked. And in, in, through history, which is interesting <laughs> and cool. Yeah, it is kind of funny to think that. Oh, man. So speaking it, of history, I have a nice segue. Joe used to always wear a hat back in the day when he was a player. And Brazier loves this fucking hat. Oh, all I don't, right? Listen, I know, okay. Right? If you're listening to this podcast right now, don't act like you don't fucking remember Joe's hat. Joe G. Orlando used to wear this certain hat. It was like a beret or something. I don't know what you call it. It's called a scally cap. A scally cap. Joe used to wear a scally cap every single event. And, you know, we used to make fun of him, not like bullying, but we used to always say like oh you have that hat on you know talk about his hat how can you never take off the hat it was a thing he's very tall he always wore his hat and now if you're watching this on patreon you can actually see the video joe he's in a nice he has a nice suit jacket on he has an arg shirt on from our previous sponsor but he doesn't have on the hat and i just want to know what happened to the famous joe Girlando hat? hat? <laughs> it just got lost over the years i have no idea where it is something i've learned in the short time i've seen you two interact <laughs> is that fraser and maybe your friends are way more interested in this hat than joe is. oh joe does not oh, get yeah. this hat at all joe didn't realize the hat was a thing he was like wait what you guys found me at events by looking for my hat literally like, he yes literally don't get me wrong yes i knew i wore it i was aware of what the hat was but i just yeah. you can see it pictured in the the picture there on the top left is from Long Beach. Yes, I, I would wear it. Yep. Joe, I, I, I mean, Joe has, a, own it. Joe has a hat on as his token, his ARG token of Stratos. He has on a hat, even in that token. That's how yeah, much I, it, I've never in my life had a hat that looks like that. I, that's that's the, just happened that is the interesting if thing. Stratos has a helmet. Like Stratos has a green helmet. Yeah. I think that's why. They should have gave you the scally cap thing. Like that's a backwards baseball cap. It is like a backward is baseball cap. Oh, the other photo. They gave my man a fitted hat and put that shit back i guess a snapback he is on a snapback which he never yeah. wore ever but yeah no, joe, even if i were to wear a hat today it's either sort of a winter cap or it's a, a fitted i have like a fitted patriots hat that i sometimes wear nice nice that's right you are a boston resident right or you i mean look behind me i got yeah i mean you're from the city of the greatest football player of all time so yep Yep. Possibly one of the greatest, possibly the greatest athlete of yep. all time. I argue that he might be the greatest athlete of all time. So a lot I'm of drinking from my Patriots mug. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. he must have a lot of pride living in Boston. Uh, I have so much. I used to, <laughs> I used to tease I Joe about the way he wrap relative to where I'm sitting, but there's a bunch in my apartment. I used to tease Joe about the way he because he has the you know the accent too. I Cods he used to say Cods. <laughs> Cods, yeah, I know. Uh, you and Paul is Paul Clark also from Boston? So we grew up about 15 minutes apart from each other, both in the northern part of Massachusetts. So neither of us in Boston. So yeah. kind of the same way that you might say you're, I don't know if you're actually from, are you technically from Philly? I literally yeah. live in Philadelphia. Like literally. Okay, so it's a little bit different there. I yeah. would say I'm from Boston because if I said where I was actually from, you would have no idea I would what have, that yeah, town is. Same, yeah, I get yeah, it. It's yeah. a small town, 15 minutes from Boston. Yep. The T is literally in the town. I could take the T to Boston and get there in 15 minutes from yep. where I grew up. No, I understand. Yeah. I understand. All and I, I live 15 minutes from each other. I don't live in Mass Massachusetts at all. I actually live in Rhode Island now, but oh, still New England. Okay. Yeah. So I similar. I was born and raised in Philly. I lived in Philly for the first 18 years of my life. I currently live right outside of Philly. But if anybody ever asks where I live, I just say Philly. So if I, I'm not explaining where I live, it's yeah. they don't know what it is. Yeah, it would mean nothing to someone who's not from the state or the, area, the surrounding yeah. area of the big city. We kind of just go to the metropolis, and that's what everyone says, and everyone does that everywhere. When I talk about Atlanta. I don't know where Pat really is. Like, he's not literally from Atlanta. You know what I mean? Like, no. Yeah. But we all just say Atlanta, but he lives in some other part of Georgia. Or that's where he's really from. So I get it. Uh, what did I want to ask you? So we did ask you about like a favorite format and you said pretty much anyone that you've played through. Do you have a favorite deck? I mean, the obvious answer might just be Macro Rabbit because I know that you taught with that deck a lot in a row, like a lot. But I don't know if that might, I don't know if that's actually your favorite deck ever, but if it is, you know. I really enjoy playing X Sabres because I think it's, a deck, especially when it got watered down a little bit. I'm talking after Rescue Cat. Yeah. 
where it just did everything that I want to do when I play Yu-Gi-Oh. I agree. It was really good in formats where there was no heavy storm, which means a lot of people are going to set a lot of their traps and there's a lot of having to read your back rows and high on formats where cards like seven tools and traps done in high on layer legal mean you have to plan a lot of turns ahead to try and like, okay, I'm going to set it up. I have Emmer's Blade, Dark Soul, and Peshul to survive, even Full Helm Knight's negation effect. Eventually, I'm going to shift the tide in my favor. The game is, generally speaking, not too overwhelming, where I actually have to worry about loot, right? And the deck had a lot of intricate little plays in it that I think surprised your opponent. When you crash Emmer's Blade and get Full Helm Knight, if you have a Book of Moon or an Econ, you can shift a monster to defense and then attack over it with Full Helm and revive Peshul, or uh, revive Dark Soul out of the grave. And now, main phase two, you have High Unlay with Full Helm Knight and the Dark Soul. And you might have an opponent who feels like they're in a pretty good position. Let's say they have Caius on field. And now all of a sudden that flip summon Emmer's Blade that you did and the crashing that you did resulted in main phase two, two X Sabres. I'm summoning full, full troll from hand. I'm going into high and light, popping your back. It can just snowball from there. Yeah. And I really like just the way X Sabre decks played because you got to plan turns ahead. You had defensive cards. You had blowout cards. You had cards like Gotham's Emergency Call that could shift the game in your favor. And it really sort of fit what I enjoy doing, which is, playing long games, grinding opponents out, trying to get the best value out of all of your resources, sort of resourcing your opponent, and sort of figuring out when in the game you need to flip the switch. Because you can't play defensive the whole game, you'll eventually lose. But you can't necessarily just play recklessly either, or you'll lose oftentimes, not all the time, but you'll often lose just by being overly reckless. So it's a nice deck to try and pinpoint, all right, this is the turn I'm going to make the push. Yep. This is the turn I'm trying to capitalize on the way the game has gone, and it gave you enough turns to make those plans. I, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you said. X Sabres was a phenomenal teacher at when to go in and when to be, you know, reserved. Because it, it was very good at playing defensive. It could set Ember's Blade and survive an onslaught of monsters. Uh, it had a searcher with Dark Soul that was kind of slow to set up. But once it got attacked, if your opponent was unaware that they should never attack a face down monster, you got benefit from that. And then it kind of could just snowball with Gotham's emergency call and stuff like that. Uh, I used to hate that deck because, so it's weird. McCabe and I, you know, we grew up at the same local best friends growing up playing the game together and everything talking about ideas he was a adamant x saber player and he's probably outside of billy break the most accomplished x saber player in the world like he has won multiple prize cards he's gotten second at a ycs with that deck he's gotten third at a ycs with that deck uh and he's probably gotten top four at two other ycs with with just x sabers like literally orlando 2011 i know he got second against travis messinger who ended up winning uh yeah and he got... I topped that one with X-Sabers too. I went undefeated in Swiss. Damn. That was yeah. my second top. But I think that's an important one because that's really when things started to click because yeah. that was after Samurai's. And then, as you just said, that deck teaches you... It teaches you. ...so much about tempo. I used to hate it. I used to hate it because McCabe would play it and I would play Plants. And it kind of beat Plants inherently. Like, before we realized the Hamster were so good, because if you set a Dandelion or a Raikou or anything like that, Full Hum and I just punished the fuck out of you. And I would often get punished by... You know, even if you had like a reborn Tengu on the field and they go book a moon and attack over with full helmet, it's like, God damn it. Like, here we go with the nonsense. Now he's going to do the fall troll main phase two. I'm going to get my hand discarded by Gotham's. It just became a whole thing. I used to despise that deck. And then I played it for one event and one event only. It was the one Tyree Tinsley won. So yeah, Providence. I remember that. Yeah. And I actually topped with X Sabres. I remember having that. Never played it before. Literally just after being beaten by McCabe with that deck so much, I just knew how it, I was like, this is how you fuck people up with this deck. Like, like I've been, It's so good. I have been fucked just, up by it so much. It gives you all the time in the world, the way the cards work. Yep. Generally speaking, you're not going to get OTK. There were decks like Infernities, which got second at that event. But generally speaking, you had enough time. Yeah. And if you understood tempo and sort of how to swing things in your favor, or even like, I'm going to make a little bit of a push. Because yeah. they have to actually respond to things like Full Hall Night. They can't just let this stuff happen. Yeah. And if they don't respond, then I'm just going to win. But also keep back resources and then like use Gotham's Call. And deck it was, was really a really, good. really good deck that if you understood how it worked, it just set you up to do well in that era as a whole. Yeah. So much of that era was research management, setting up, sequencing your traps, things like that. So it's clear to say that you miss resource management in terms of how it used to be. Because now, you know, people argue that like we they are still ma like the people who play now, they are still resource management to a degree is it's very different, though, because the cards are so powerful. Whereas back then you when you had to manage your resources, the cards were very weak in comparison to modern Yu-Gi-Oh. And so they didn't lose you the game immediately when uh, you mismanaged your resources. Like you could you could do a bad torrential and still crawl back from it over time. You know what I mean? Like you can kind of rebuild. I don't think you get much opportunity if you mismanage your resources now. Like if you just, if you fuck up, you just lose. 
the game is just condensed to one turn. So it's like, did you draw a lightning storm? Yes or no? If you drew it, you're going to play it. And Unless your opponent just went like set a back row pass for some, un they probably would just lightning storm it and kill them if that's what happens. Yeah, well, so that that is what happens. I actually saw it on stream uh, recently. Someone said yeah, he's, play I think he's playing Alter Geist or something, and he set like one or two back row. It's like, well, that guy's going to play lightning storm and kill you no matter what you did. There's no research management. The game is one turn. Yeah, research management is more. <laughs> can I manage it within this turn and use the cards that I drew in an effective position? Right? Can I use my emergence search that's only once per turn at the appropriate time so that it either searches the sword soul that i needed or the protos yeah or do i do it early so that i can go into baron to negate nib if they have it and then forego the opportunity to use it in the second part of my turn when i want to search protos like that's the research management yeah it's, i'm going to use every card i drew on the first <laughs> turn in some capacity what is the sequencing that plays around the, the highest percentage of hand traps that still doesn't even necessarily can play around all of them and then with the best possible turn and then pass back to my opponent and use my negations at the appropriate times and then once we've done that maybe there's a third turn where i respond and come back and win but we're not going to four turns so there is no it can is, i get this torrential max value it doesn't value. It is exist abundantly clear to me that joe has been very frustrated <laughs> <laughs> with modern Yu-Gi-Oh. i know you've been testing and you're testing sadly in solitaire with two decks you don't even need a person. And I argue. No, you don't. You really don't. You legitimately, depending on the two decks you want to play, you can you can do it yourself. Two decks against yourself. And that is absurd. I, I joke about it all the time. Silverman and I, we we joke about this all the time, but like you really don't need a person across from you. A lot of times when people lose, they get up and say, You could have just told me and I wouldn't have sat down. Like if you <laughs> I if had you this match with one of my I already referenced this match, but the other day, it was like last week, it was the person that I talked about who was playing PK where he did the side. played the match thing. Thing. and in game three, he just like started he just played two cards i didn't have any hand traps and i said i'll just scoop like let's, yeah, yeah. Just, oh, let's save scoop. us like, both people sometimes. Scoop. like people don't scoop when they have no hand traps he's like no they make me play it out i'm like what the heck is wrong with people like what do they think they're gonna draw listen you're talking to the guy who wrote the article called learn to scoop the art of scooping like i literally this is a game three it's not like i'm conserving time but i'm conserving my own personal time yes yeah. exactly like yeah. I, i've already learned what the combo is i even let him play it out game one to see how he did it you know yeah. does he do it right does he actually did it so correct game one. He did the thing that you can do in PK where you pop sank, or you pop scythe twice. I don't I, know if you've seen that before. I don't I do but not you, know what you're talking about. It's crazy. So you can trigger the 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 link monster, trusty or rusty, rusty whatever his name Bardish, is. Yeah. Yeah, and you can trigger that by bringing some guy back and then also kill your Dagda. And when Dagda dies in the standby phase, it recurs a uh, recurs an artifact. So it brings some view. So yeah, so if you go like bring a guy back to a zone that Rusty points to, pop my, pop my scythe. If I respond with Chalice on scythe, then you just go, okay, I'll use DPE to pop my scythe and my on-field Dagda, and then Dagda resolves to bring back scythe. So you so, can have Chalice, so no matter and I'm just going to still do it. Yeah. You can have Droplet. Like, you would have to Droplet and discard like your whole hand to just stop that. But if you had just Chalice, it plays around just Chalice. It also plays around just Imperm on the, on the artifact scythe. That's so I'm working. like, you did it so correct that you actually could have played around me having anything if i drew chalice as my six card it wouldn't have mattered you could you could trigger sight twice yeah so when game three came around you were like i got it you, you know yeah, i don't like, even like i have to get <laughs> yeah what are we doing here yeah a lot of the decks are spreadsheet decks i call them they like that you know you can just like Yu Gi Oh right now if i wanted to play i'm gonna be honest i could jump in at any moment and i would probably be one of the best players at my local immediately uh probably one of the best players in the game again immediately just because i've been watching a lot and the decks once i know the combo it really just comes down to uh, what i always talk about just like when do i negate when do i just let you play uh what hand traps to look out for and that's really it the, as hoban said in the past episode of the podcast a lot of the advantage in Yu-Gi-Oh now comes from just your deck itself like the deck building technical play technical skill the thing that we used to favor back in like the x and plant format when to go in and all that it doesn't really factor there's no when to go in you just go in if you draw moye you're just going to summon Moye and do exactly what you like. If your opponent doesn't stop you, you're going to do your whole play. There's no, oh, but maybe like if I get Veil, or maybe it's safer to set the monster this turn and set a trap, T set, and then I can go Moye next. There's none of that. There's no T setting. There's none of there's I no, used to set Rescue Rabbit. If I had enough defensive cards, I legit used to set Rescue Rabbit sometimes. That's a choice. That's like a it'd choice. be like middle of the game. Like my opponent would have like two back rows push rescue rabbit into them but i also don't want just like like i don't want to summon rescue rabbit and just have it responded to so yeah. if i felt like they hadn't been summoning monsters so it, it was less of a risk that rescue rabbit would be attacked over and i had defensive traps anyway i would set it because sometimes you can bait 
because Heavy Storm was legal in rabbit format. Yeah. So sometimes you could go flip rabbit. They'd be like, oh my God, flip rabbit. And be like, you have to respond to it. And I still have my normal summon. So if I use this and summon Tor Guide, you need to have two interruptions. And this yeah, is a Heavy Storm format. Is... So you might not have set all your back rows. So, I mean, it sounds like yeah, you it's a you choice. Set rabbit. Like, no, I set rabbit every now and then. Not every match. Yeah, obviously it doesn't come up a lot. The standard play the is game, going to be summon rabbit. But the, the fact middle is... Middle of the game. Sometimes your opponent has a few back rows. Clearly they don't have any monsters. Middle of the game. I don't want to just trade my normal summon for a back row. Yep. I don't want to go summon rabbit. It gets interrupted. Summon tour guide next turn and give them the chance to set the second defensive card because yep. they're playing around heavy. It's not out of the realm of possibility to set rabbit. You would never do yeah. that today because the Yu-Gi-Oh is one turn. Yeah, that that's is a lot. lost a lost art. That's that's the stuff that I like. That's that's like when everybody talks about like pro heavy where you set your heavy storm to like set people up. But that what you just said with setting your rabbit is like it's a very similar play to it's setting pro your rabbit. Heavy storm. Definitely pro rabbit. It's pro, it's pro rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, pro rabbit. That's a good one. But I, yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh is so different now. I feel like I could watch a lot of YouTube because YouTube is a great resource. I can't express that enough. It's a phenomenal resource. I could also play a lot of Dueling Book, which would give me a headache and probably drive me fucking insane because I just I've never liked. Dueling Network or Dueling Book because people just go AFK on me all the time. I just have really bad luck, I guess. And you can't You're really get a, you can't get a judge in a reasonable amount of time, so you just have to kind of sit there. And I'm a person who will not let you win because you went AFK. So my pride, I will leave that tab open and go do something else. But I am not letting you fucking get out of this. I can't do that anymore. Like I'm too old for that shit now. But very but, true. But I wanted to jump back in. You know, between like Silverman's playing again, McCabe has been dabbling. A lot of my friends have come back to the game. Uh, I'm in like a group chat, like Furman and stuff. Like it's a lot of people. A lot like there's so many. Do people. they like it? Do they like the game? Do they like it? Does Silverman, Furman, no, McCabe, no, none of them, none like of, it? not a single one of them likes it. I yeah, that I mean that question was very blunt, and at first I didn't know what you were talking. They do not like it. I didn't think they would, but I was just curious. No, they do not like it. They like everyone. Every one of my old friends that currently plays complains constantly what okay here's their main complaint and this one is kind of funny but it's it's so true the cards have way too much fucking text now oh my god when i first came back my <laughs> first regional back my very first regional back i barely knew anything besides what my alter guys deck did i round two i play against the dude running foreign pendulums oh no the whole deck and i love foreign cards don't get me wrong clearly watch my deck profile my old stuff is for my modern stuff unless it's like very obvious what the card does like pot of desires yeah. it's english because i need to read it yeah this dude with his foreign endymion <laughs> like he tells me what it does but there's like 12 different effects and obviously i try to target it and he's like no it can't be targeted it says that too like i can't read it i'm gonna take your crit but yeah it's just unbelievable. I mean, like literally it's like this much text and it's in a different language and i can't read it yeah the best, the best part about like to summarize and he's like okay it does this 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 and if it has a token on it it does this too or a counter on it i'm like i'll take your word for it sure yo i was laughing last night because someone played pendulums at locals and the text on the cards are so small because they have so much text i said yo that fucking card has two text boxes because pendulum cards have literally yep. two text boxes i started yes, laughing do. i started laughing at the thought of having to read both text boxes that's just that it was just the icing on the cake for me. I was like, I'm never coming back to this fucking game. Like, this is too much. That was another deck that I was like, all right, I need to get these cards in English. They're very cheap, and I'm just going to solitaire it for an hour, and I learned how the deck works. So that yeah. was just another one of those, like, all right, I, I don't want to have to read this ever again in yeah, real life. I always have During that. a tournament, I don't have the time for that. I, I, let me just spend the hour. It's kind of a fun deck to solitaire, actually. And then, all right, I know what that deck does. So Good. Don't I, have to worry about I always say, if you have to read your opponent's cards in the middle of a match, you probably lost. It's bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once you start to read their cards, it's really hard, no matter how good you are. You could be one of the best players in the world, one of the best people who puts together card interactions in your mind. You could do all of that. The brain power it takes to navigate a situation that you literally have never been through and trying to memorize like how the cards function, all their little tiny, especially now, every card has four or five effects. It's impossible to navigate all of that at, at, the, at that moment. I at that never moment. read the cards when I knew what was going on. Same. I knew what my deck did. I knew what the other decks did. And I knew what some of the even like weird decks tier did. two or three stuff. Yeah. I played on the bubble of a YCS literal ninjas before. Yep. The last YCS I ever topped literal ninjas. I didn't have to read anything. I knew, I knew they had a trap that sent my monster to the grave. So I had to be very cautious about going into my extra deck. Cause I knew that they had that weird trap card. So I, I knew it. I knew what their deck actually did. Yep. And I imagine they won a lot of matches against people that had no idea just because nobody actually played ninjas. ninjas. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I understand. And luckily, my local had a lot of people who played random decks. So when I went to a YCS and I played against some random thing like Worms, and they have that Meteorite card that is insane, I knew the only card in your entire deck I have to worry about is that Meteorite thing. Everything else in your deck is trash. But that Meteorite trap card, yeah, that Meteorite trap card gets flipped, and I could genuinely lose with plants to Worms, and then everyone will laugh yep. at me. So I, I knew, like, okay... When he sets a back row, do not use Trap Stun. Do not use Seven Tools on anything he does. If he warnings your monster, let it go. <laughs> like, and another thing, and this, this matters, you know, in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, I listened to Pat's podcast that you had on just the other day. Yeah. I listened to it. To, I listened to it today. He, he talked about playing Salamangrate at the remote YCS. And if he played Salamangrate format, he would have known what the cards did because yes. he has a point in time that he recently started playing. Things that happened prior he's probably going to make mistakes into that deck, not because he's not a good player, because he just doesn't know. Yeah. Round one, just because this one comes to mind, Columbus, plant format. The second one, Billy won. Plants is basically tier one. I don't, I don't think it was tier zero. It I was think not it was tier, tier zero. One. Yeah. It was not tier zero. It was tier one. So was Agents was maybe right little, around there. Yeah, a little, a little, little under. And, Dark World was also around at the time. Little, yeah. yeah. I think Plants was tier one and yes. maybe the only tier one deck, but it wasn't tier zero. Exactly. But round one, I played against Gladiator Beast, which had not been meta relevant for a while, but I played literal GB format. I played all the GB formats after. GB has very, very particular rules as to what you can and cannot do. Yep. Right? You can't just do, leave Dandelion to on the field. Do not you set a monster. Yeah. Do not just set Sangin. Don't let Dandelion ever go to the grave if you can't use those tokens immediately. Yep. Side out scapegoat, right? Like there are just fundamental. Yeah. And yeah, a GB player that can beat somebody that's never yeah. played that format for sure. They're going to go test Tiger, Secutor, attack your scapegoat, and they're just going to win the game. Well, I mean, not that I couldn't lose the game, but I knew, okay, <laughs> these are the cards I need to side out, even if those interactions didn't one, because I played those formats. Yeah. If I sit down and play against a deck that may have been popular a couple of years ago, if I haven't seen it before, it's going to be a struggle. Good example is the Cyber Dragon deck. A lot of local players love to run Cyber Dragons. A lot of, you know, I've played against it at regionals. I've played against it at a lot of events. At this point now in my return, and I'm playing against it enough times, I've sort of learned some of the ins and outs. Yeah. Good example. They have that Nova card at the extra deck. It's the one that you actually use against the invoked package, against the, rather, the Maximus package. Yeah. If it gets sent to at the graveyard. A, like, I forget, it was something like a 3 case turn, some big tournament. I played against that deck round one and I had nib and I knew the second they galaxy soldier two level fives on the field, I needed to nib there before they went into the Nova out of the extra deck or else if I nibbed, they would actually still get the Nova. If that was the first event that I had been playing this and I just looked at their field and I'm like, they haven't really done anything. I'm going to keep holding nib. I would have held nib. And then all of a sudden I would have been like, well, I look like the idiot. I held nib and now they have Nova on field. And, and then it goes into infinity and then you get sucked up and then you lose. You need to play against these decks yeah. at least once. It's a huge, huge factor because you're going to play against these random decks. And, and now more coming than back, ever, you lose yeah. the game. You lose. You, like, you just lose. Like Pat lost to Solomon Great, which is not a good deck at all. That deck is just nope. not good. And you could lose to it because you don't have many turns to figure Like You know what I mean? You don't have turns to even figure it out. No. Can, no. You have no, no time it, to figure it out. It's hard enough to read the talk cards. Kill you. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard enough to read the cards, let alone have enough turns to play play them out like nope it's literally like do or die turn one can you figure out what i'm doing can you know when to hand trap me if you didn't play this format you're going to lose yeah there That's are a entirely... huge barrier to get back in huge one yeah that is that is the barrier and honestly i think one of the only reasons i feel like i can confidently jump in now is because i came back to watching and spectating every week in the summertime like early summer june i want to say somewhere around then and i've been reading every everybody's so happy to show me their deck I've seen Attic Nister does that stupid combo with the field spell where it just keeps on link climbing and makes a monster that is basically untargetable, yep. undestruct, indestructible. Yep. It, I've seen that. So I actually know how that duck functions. I've seen the Invoke duck. I've seen Shadal. I've seen all of that. I've seen Altergeist. I've seen PK. I've seen a lot of Drytron, a lot of Tri Brigade. Obviously, those decks were prominent. I've seen Peak, like the actual uh, Prank Kid deck, that PK version deck or whatever. I've literally I lost seen. To a deck at my local last night that I had never seen before. And I just lost game one to it. I won the match, but it was super quantum. So if you're familiar with those, they're actually based on the Power Rangers. So I've been told. Uh, yes, because Calvin Tahan won an ARG with them way back in the day. So I do know. Super oh, really? Quantum. They the, summoned like another the, the, one. Yeah, they're like, like a the, red, a green and a blue one, maybe. Like he literally like XYZ summoned. Like he used his whole hand except two Thunder Dragons that he had left. And he just link summoned this thing with seven material or uh, XYZ with seven materials. 
and then passed. And the whole time I was reading his cards, and I'm like, okay, this card must be so good that you just <laughs> XYZ'd three cards into this. And yep. he's like, it's pretty good. It seven materials under it. And it was like unaffected, like compulse uh, Thunder King Ryo, all like in one card. Yes. And you with 36 attack. And you lost to it, obviously, because that card is outrageous. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the only out would have been to get the, the level 10 sword soul guy above the 36 threshold yeah with the banish pile but i didn't have desires which is basically the only way to get that many cards banished that quickly so yeah i just lost to it yep but it's a good example of a deck where it's like that was a ycs like you're definitely winning game one because i don't really know where this is going and once you show me where it's going like oh yep can't beat that one it's too late yeah that one plays especially with the current format seemingly has you know seven to ten decks that are relevant. They're not the they're not the tier one decks or the tier but zero. But they can decks, all beat but, you, yeah. Yeah, but there's like seven to ten decks that are already relevant now. Let alone if somebody plays a deck that was relevant a format or two ago. Yeah, like I wouldn't even include Solomon Great in the list of decks that I think are are like playable in this current format. But but no. Pat just played it at the remote YCS for whatever reason, and it can beat you, which is you know like that's here's another one. So there is a very unique skill set that you needed back in the day to play against Chainburn. Yes, you're probably is. fully aware of it. Like, like, man, so many people had no idea what to do against that deck. Like, you draw double MST, you should be praying to the like, oh, thanking the gods. So it's not lucky. because you can end phase MST. It's not because you can end phase MST. It's because you can go chain link two MST, and they're like, oh, chain link this. And you're like MST, and then they're like, oh, accumulated for you can't. Yep. There are two cards in the chain that have MST. Yep. Like, <laughs> nobody knew. Not to say nobody knew, but people would play against these decks and just they would just. They would lose because they let themselves like they had very winnable yeah. situations and they would lose. You and they could just have didn't won know that game. You could have won these games. I played against the first remote YCS. I played against Mystic Mind round one. And there is a very, very particular skill set <laughs> or just mindset that you need to play against that deck. And it goes back to some of the older skill drain burn decks. And it just translates over here, which is to beat these decks, you need to overload the back rows. You need to basically wait as long as humanly possible and overload their back rows. What that means is. In one swoop, you need to be, like, in my, old Yu-Gi-Oh would be, I'm going to flip Dust Tornado, MST, and Heavy this turn. You can't stop all of those. Yep. I will eventually break your board, and then I'm going to OTK you. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh, what I did against him is it, like, went back and forth and eventually got to the part where that Cauldron card was going to kill me, so I needed to react. What is and it? I had only drawn two. Uh, the what card? Called Cauldron of the Old Man. Okay. It's their primary win condition. It's basically incremental burn damage every single turn, and it sort of scales. Okay. So it starts off by dealing, like, 300 damage and then it goes to like 600 to you and eventually it gets into increments over a thousand and at that point you're going to lose pretty quick it's almost like a wave motion that actually pays rent in the sense that it okay. will actually deal damage as the game goes on so it was to a point where i had no more turns in the sense that if i allowed my opponent to fall and burn me out but i went vortex or a lightning storm and he negated with solemn and because it negates the activation i can lightning storm again and he didn't have a second versus disruption and yeah. it cleared his field and i ended up i ended up beating him yeah you overloaded but, it yeah if I, I've seen, because I remember watching when I first started playing and watching, I think it was the PPG circuit, but somebody was playing against Mystic Mind and they, they drew Cosmic Cyclone and just played it and it got negated. And I'm, I thought to myself, I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched how Mystic Mind decks work in one game and I already sort of just go back to how did you beat Skill Drain Burn a decade ago? Yeah. MST, good. We're going to keep that in my yeah. hand. Heavy Storm, we're going to keep that. We're going to keep these. Yeah, Breaking a Magical like, Warrior, bit, I'll hold on to that too. It's like, ooh, I drew Caius. Like, I'm going to get my Book of Moon next. Like, I'm going to set this up. We're going to get through yep. the skill drain. Caius, I'm going to go skill drain. I'm going to go chain yes, Book of Moon. Yes. And then all in one turn, I'm going to be like, tribute for Caius, chain book. And they're like, all right, they have to respond to that. Chain MST, you have to respond to that. It's like, great, heavy. And they're like, oh, okay. Yep. You yep. overloaded my back rows. I can't stop four things. And at one turn, I'm going to kill you or put you in a situation where you actually just I, lose. I will, you, you are going to lose, right? That's how you play against these. Yeah. I'm going to call them prison decks, right? Mystic Mind, Skill Drain Burn. These are all prison style decks. Overload the back rows. Huge lesson. Translate throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history. Yeah, that's I, true. I uh, really like that. That's um, that's something we talked about on a couple episodes now, but knowing, just because you have a card that is live, knowing when to play it, don't play it just as soon as it's ready is... is well, if you play modern really Yu-Gi-Oh, it's one turn. Yeah. Right? You, you don't have... You, you never needed to learn. Do you know what's funny? Uh, current Yu-Gi-Oh players, a lot of them, and, you know... I'm, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to sound like I'm just shitting on people who oh. play current Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, this is oh, the most more episode we've had. <laughs> but like current Yu-Gi-Oh players tend to not know how to play past turns one, two, and three. Because it's like turn one set up, turn two, you break or don't break, and then turn three, the winner's decided, right? And that's the end of the game. For the most part, that's like every game. Whenever it goes past that, you start to notice that these people cannot actually play Yu-Gi-Oh. Like they have no idea how to navigate those waters when it gets awkward. 
when the game got extended past, you know, two, two or three turns. And, it, and Mystic Mind tends to do that every single time it's played because, it, you know, people don't main, people don't even main decking out to it, honestly. Most people just don't they usually have order. Yeah, but that they, it, that takes time to set up, right? And yeah, you have order, but that, that takes time to set up. You have to draw it for one, you have to set it for two, and then you have to not have their song. Most decks that play Mystic Mind, Sky Striker, when I, I think of it, is like, they tend to play things that also can, like, negate uh, back row removal. But my whole thing is that when the game gets extended, right? And it gets awkward. It's like, I couldn't kill you turn one like I wanted to. Now I have to figure out how to, like, use my resources and throw them at you. You get those people who draw Cyclone and they just play it immediately. And then It takes a lot of effort to be good at those types of things because yeah. the decision trees get really complex. It's not just that first turn when you have your whole extra deck and your whole deck at your disposal. Because that is something that I struggle with. It's like, ugh, I'm playing Sword Soul and, like, the games that do go to those turn two or three, now all of a sudden it's like, how many 10 years are left? What's my extra? Day? And it gets really complicated. Yeah. And it's like, I need to invest so much time to really get good at this, which is frustrating. Yeah. It, that's a little bit of a barrier to entry to me. And it's, I have all the respect in the world for players that are successful because they do what you just said really well. They do. The top players can do that. That's why they consistently top. Yep. And I just know how much effort it takes and to actually get to that level. I agree with what you said about the barrier of entry being time. So everyone who asked me to play the biggest reason that i do not play is because i'm doing a podcast twice a week at this point i'm a full-time accountant you know i work from home which is a godsend but like even with working from home and not having to commute to work every day and all of that stuff it still takes a lot of time to do 40 hours of work uh prep for podcasts record podcasts and then just live my life like i do other things besides those two things right like i have a life outside of that it, it's just a lot of time and Yu Gi Oh. Back in the day, I spent a lot of time when I did play Yu-Gi-Oh. Like when I was a student in oh, college. Oh, so much. Yeah, we would spend eight hours a day playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, or just talking about Yu-Gi-Oh. Like me and Alistair and McKay, we would be on AIM and we would talk for fucking until 3 a.m. Because I was in college, so I had all the time in the world. But we would just talk for hours and hours and hours about Yu-Gi-Oh every single day. And I don't have that luxury anymore. Just quite frankly, I just simply do not have that luxury being, in, you know, as old as I am. And that is a barrier of entry. I don't think I could actually play Yu-Gi-Oh if I wanted to, and if I did, I feel like my tops, if any, would come down to just being like very lucky in a sense, because I don't have the time to investigate every scenario that I'm likely to come across. Whereas before, I actually pretty much have seen every scenario that possibly could happen in 2010. There was nothing in 2010 that could happen that I had no knowledge of whatsoever. Even if I didn't experience it, Billy might walk up to me and say, the craziest thing just happened to me against Dark World. And he tells me the crazy play that happened, how he beat it. And now I know that scenario for the rest of my life. I don't have that luxury anymore and I don't have people just feeding me information. You know what I mean? Like there's just so many scenarios that can come up and like, no one can really help you. If you play against Solomon, great. And you have no idea what the hell they do. I'm just out on my own at that point. Um, and I don't like that. Feeling. I know what you mean. It, it does take a lot of time because the, it's almost like a, it's almost like a detriment to have previously had success at one point because you knew what it took to get there. Yes. It's it almost like me. going back to the times that I was successful or had success in general, I knew what it was like to play a game against someone and feel like you dictated the course of action. Yeah, yes, very, very it's much like, so. Even if you were losing, I almost felt like I would sit down and I already had this so this mental state of like, I know what my deck does, I know what their deck could do. Like, I'm just like, let's go. And now it's almost like I sit down and I'm like, all right, like, this feels weird. Like, I yes, just, it's nervous. Yeah, I just, like, the anxiety. I'm like, it, it, did I, like people will hopefully ask me, like, hey, can you see your graveyard out? And I'm like, oh, did I do something wrong? And I'm like, like all free. Or did I do something? You're you, looking at so your many opening, restrictions. Right? You're looking at your opening five. And you're waiting for a hand trap to show up because you're you're frantically hoping that you draw a hand it's, trap. It's, it's not even that anymore. It's not even that. It's just like back in the day, I knew what I was doing in the sense that I felt confident that what I was doing was at least at the time there was a reason that I felt like it was the right play at the every turn that progressed. Like I felt like. I would make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. But I felt like I was driving the way the game's going. And now I'm like playing and I'm like, all right, maybe this is what I want. I just don't feel that sort of mental state or that that mindset that I used to. So that is something that I struggle with because, you know, when I sit down to play, I don't have that confidence that I used to have. Yeah. And I know that at the end of the day, one of the driving factors behind having success previously was 
the psych side of it, the mindset side of it. And I know that yeah. that's not something I currently have and how much it's going to take to try and get back there. Okay. So I see what you're talking. We're talking about two different things. I thought I have anxiety at the idea of sitting across from my opponent and losing the game on turn one with a zero interaction uh, because I didn't draw correctly. That bothers me I, so, so, so much, but you're not talking about that. You're talking I've about played Frog FPK, I've played through wind up hand loop. I've played through yeah. those formats. I have always accepted that as part of the game. That doesn't really bother me because going into the event i always accounted for a couple losses that way yeah even whole matches that way it was if i know what i'm doing and i believe in my deck and play stuff technical play all that i'll be able to win the other nine rounds so who cares when that happens it's really the top cut where that matters so let's just remain confident and focused and have that mindset but now i don't have that same when i sit down feel like i'm driving the course of play i feel like i'm i feel like i'm the player that i used to take advantage of is probably the best yeah, way yeah, to say yeah. oh shit you know what I mean? Like, I feel yeah. like I am like that person who like sort of knows what they're doing. Like, I know how to play the first. Right. I know you sit across I've from a guy enough time to know what to do. But then my opponent does things and I'm like, oh, OK, I definitely just played right into that. I, I won't do that again. Like, I'll make a note of that. I'm yeah. good not to make the same mistake twice, but I ha but I do need to make the mistake once. And back in the day, I didn't usually make those at YCSs. Maybe in the testing and local scene, like, I'd play enough to make the mistakes, to learn them. Put them in my like, memory and be like, okay, never do that for real. At now yeah. I know I'll be playing these matches and people will take advantage of something. I'll be like, oh, I used to win games because of what I just did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just yeah. left myself vulnerable and I'm going to lose because of this. I deserve to lose. I made a mistake, but I'm not at the confidence level to go into a YCS with that. And I'm going to hopefully in the next three weeks try to prepare. I've been putting in a lot of work. But I just know how long it's going to take to try and get back there. Yeah, that's interesting. That's I thought we were talking about something else. But when you brought that up, like you're the person now that you used to take advantage of. Yeah, I remember sitting across from people at YCS events, or national stuff like that. I knew within the first, I don't know, the first two minutes that I was going to win. Just just based on the way they played, like just just the little things, like the way they play their cards. Maybe they might be nervous because they're playing against me, stuff like that. Like things that I can take advantage of later on in the game because you, I can bluff you. You're scared of me already. Like things like that. They don't really matter anymore. Like just, and my mindset was so strong. I was confident and I knew exactly what I'm doing. I know what your deck does too. I know what your deck does probably better than you do. And I can't say that now. And if I played for three months straight, I couldn't say that either. Like I could play three months of Source Soul only. And I couldn't confidently say that I know what the deck across from me does better than a person. Like, if I played against Phantom Knights, so, there's no way. The last list, the sort of the prior ban list with three tankies, I played Tribreed long enough to get a little bit more confidence. Not yeah. overwhelmingly confident, but I went to this sort of three case tournament and I remember playing against someone who was making mistakes. And I felt so proud of myself in the moment to be sitting. I am noticing their mistakes. Mm. I haven't noticed a mistake from my opponent in like eight years. Yeah. Take into consideration the fact that I took breaks. But I'd go to the locals when I first started playing and I just assume everyone's playing everything. But I played Tri Brigade, so I sort of knew yeah, like that theoretically right. what they should be doing. And I was sitting there and I'm like, wow, this is I haven't had this feeling in a very long time. I, cool. I, I miss this feeling because when you know what your deck should be doing, what your opponent deck should be doing, it's a good feeling because then it helps you obviously play around what they could do. Yeah. So the hope is to try and get back because that is a good feeling, knowing to that level what a format is admit is made up of yeah i'm confident that you'll get there if you put the work in i mean that's what it really comes down to we talk about time as a resource often if you put in a time i believe you can get there it's just it's so tough as you said it though. is it's like it, that's uh, the hardest if you put in the work i think it, like tommy Rowe, for example he topped his first ycs back technically yeah. like the remote yep. one uh but yep. he's I also he's also in school so he's like when i was in my prime i was also in school and I have so much free time. It's yeah, it like, is. It's all free time. Like school college is, just, is all free time. Yeah, I, I tell people that all the time. Like when you're in college, you technically have all the time in the world. So that you, was my probably you too. That was the height of ARG for me. Yes, like, that was. Being I would college take my great. classes to avoid classes on Friday and yep. even on Monday if I could, so I could fly out to events. Yep. I had all the time in the world to go to as many locals as my heart desired. Yep. I had time, and, and now we don't have that. I would do homework on flights and it would be no big deal. Yeah, I will write a paper and everything on the way there. I mean, we don't really have, like work is very different. You know, you're a teacher, so that means planning out a lot of things. And I'm gonna yeah, kind it's of not even same thing. It's it's, it's not crazy. even like seven to three. It's okay, now I have to go home and grade and plan. And yep, your, your, your job extends a, after yeah, you leave way, work. way faster. Luckily, my job 
when I turn my computer yeah. off, I'm I'm actually done. But but yeah. then I go into well podcast twice a week, and that that requires its own thing. Like I have to watch things just to have content. Like I have to absorb yeah. information constantly. I have to watch anime and video games and things like that constantly just to absorb information to be able to talk about to stay relevant for the podcast. I have to rewatch things that I might have already seen to stay relevant. And I'm sure with your Yu Gi Oh history page, which is doing yeah, very well, to... you have to also do a lot of research. The research, honestly, a lot of it I remember. I could probably sit down and build most decks just from memory or pretty dang close to it. Yeah. But I do, I will go look it up. But then recording it and editing it, it's an hour, two, three hour process. Yeah. I, 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 have, I have to lug all of my collection binders, seven or eight binders of just old Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And then I set everything up. And at the same time, I'm engaged. I want to spend time with my fiance. Like I have a real life too, besides teaching, which is in and of itself your traditional 40 hour a week job. Plus the maybe 15, 20 hours, depending on the week that you invest in teaching outside of school. Yeah. Just doing other parts of the job, plus trying a retro Yu-Gi-Oh page and trying to get back into modern Yu-Gi-Oh and planning a wedding, having a life just in general, too. So it's it is tough to balance all of those. By the way, congrats on being engaged. Oh, thank you. Hell yeah. And with all of that, definitely not enough time to read every article on metagame in one night. (laughs) Not anymore. (laughs) Not anymore. Not anymore. Well, we can start to wrap this up. We are passing the two-hour mark. It's been really great to have you, Joe. Uh, Before we go, I want to do a couple of things. So first, I want to give a shout out to Dabber's Gaming Cafe in Georgia. Uh, It's run by one of the guys I know. His name is Saul. I have him on Facebook. We've been friends for a very long time. Every time I go to Atlanta, we usually link up, have a good time. Me, him, and my friend Michi. Uh, He has a card store out there. Great locals. I'm looking at a lot of the pictures from it. So Dabber's Gaming Cafe, you can find their Facebook page. Check that out. Also, we have a Patreon for the I Am There podcast. So I always give a shout out to our patrons at the end of each episode or sometimes in the middle or in the beginning. I just want to give a quick shout out to Connie, Austin, Leon, Quest, Garen, Xavier, Hylian, TCG Automotive, Silver Chronic, Tari Tinsley, Dimitri Barnes, Alexander Brissett, Vinny Casello, Dominic Roberts, Giovanni Avalos, Game Freak Yoshi, Alex Flamer, Michael, Gabrielle Marini, and Andre Reynolds. Thank you guys so much for being patrons. The two newest ones, Andre and Gabrielle. Thank you guys so much for being uh, joining the I Am There podcast family over at Patreon. We have exclusive content. We drop exclusive episodes that are only on Patreon. And you can see video versions of every single podcast on our Patreon. So check that out. Uh, we also have a Discord server. So if you want access to the Discord server, you can access it at our lowest tier. We have a YouTube page. You know, subscribe to that. We drop the podcast on there as well. Uh, audio only right now. But yeah, check out our Patreon, check out our YouTube channel. And Joe, I know you also, like we mentioned, you have a really, really nice YouTube channel that focuses on the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! So I want to give you an opportunity to shout out that as well. Yeah, so it's YGO underscore history on YouTube. Also on Twitter, you can check it out in order to find old deck profiles, sometimes matches. I try to provide not just this is the deck, but also what the reasoning was for players, whether it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or however long the event happened to be. I usually base it on a particular deck at a particular point in each format. So I I delve all into not only what the deck is, what the side deck was, but other decks that were relevant at the time. And I try to explore the old reasoning behind different card choices and why certain decks were successful. And if this Time Wizard retro Yu-Gi-Oh thing is going to be a, a real facet of Yu-Gi-Oh going forward, I think it would be a a unique resource to start with, obviously, and we said this throughout the podcast, every old deck would get tweaked, in some cases, probably quite a bit, but it's definitely a good foundation to start with to yeah. see what, let's say, 2008 looked like. And then from there, you can modernize it as much as your heart desires, just like Goat has. But it's definitely a good place to start to see what people were thinking 12, 13, 14 years ago. And then, obviously, through your playtesting, it'll it'll change. But yeah. definitely think, a good place to start. Yeah, I think Joe's... Well, YouTube channel is a phenomenal resource for old Yu-Gi-Oh! And if Konami does, in fact, we talked about a good portion of this podcast was just on that. If Konami does go forward with the idea of these retro formats, then Joe's page is going to be really, really good <laughs> for, for that type of thing. I want to say something I do like about your channel, like to give you credit. Um, I have, for me, it's really easy to watch your videos. I haven't seen a ton of them, but the few that I have seen uh, before doing the podcast today, uh, they're just really down to earth. It's not like the really, for me, cringy, hey, how you doing, everybody? Da, 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 da. This is, <laughs> you know, the the I the, the really cringy grading. Hey, guys, how you doing? Welcome back. YouTube gang here. Blow up the light. Like, that stuff grates me so hard. And I, 
even if the content in the video is good and informative, I just can't get, I just can't get into it. Like it, it, it drags me down. So when I watch your videos, it's the style of content that I do enjoy, where it's just a lot more down to earth and it's the content I want and the, the guy behind the camera just being the guy and not being, it's the guy behind the camera for all intents and purposes, even if it is a character, it feels like a real person instead of the character being blatantly on display. Yeah. I'm a teacher. I mean, it is, I can't be flashy. I have to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. who yeah. I am. Down to earth work, is his you know, job. It sort of is. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it is nice. I like listening to Joe speak. I actually can just, like, I can literally listen to his videos. I don't need the re visual representation at this point after playing. I've played through all the same formats, but listening to him speak is very just easy on the ears. Um, and also, I think both of us are, people call us overthinkers. Like, when I was watching your video you recently. call me an underthinker. <laughs> I was watching Joe's recent video where he played an actual duel and he thought about so many different things that a lot of people might get frustrated and say, it's easy, just MST is back row, summon monk, pitch the monster born, pitch the mind control and kill him, right? But he goes over, well, I could set this, I could do this. I'm the same exact way. So I resonate with his mind, like the way he thinks, because I think about, I overthink too. Like I think about every possible thing that could happen, maybe to my own detriment when it comes to the aspect of time, but for the purpose of a YouTube page where there is no time constraint, technically, you know, I, I love it. Like it's for me, it's the videos are amazing because he can just talk as much as he wants. And I just, I just soak in everything. Congrats on that. Congrats on engagement, Joe. And we look forward to having you back hopefully next year at some point, 2022. Uh, if you see some success with these coming formats, you know, after doing whatever you have to do to get, to get back to the old Joe, cause the old Joe, could tear through some duelists, no problem, and top a bunch of YCSs. So if you can get back, if you can channel that energy, get back into that mindset where you know everything, every scenario, uh, that'd be great. I'll try my best. It'll take a while, but yeah. I will try my best. I know my own limitations really well. Yes. That's always been a strength. All right. Well, as I always say at the end of these podcasts, do the things that make you happy. Now. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, guys. Peace. Thank you.